Hello world, a very, very good afternoon. Namaste and Nisam Bulavinaka from Sydney, Australia. A rather wet, wet, wet morning here in uh, Sydney, afternoon rather. And I hope wherever you are, you are nice and comfortable. I am Sashi Singh and welcome to Sashi Singh's Talking Point on this last Sunday in March. In episode 14 of the Sashi Singh's Talking Point program today, we will shortly be joined by Dr. Nilesh Gounder, Senior Lecturer in Economics at the University of the South Pacific. We will discuss and analyze the mini-budget, or what is now termed the revised budget, that was handed down in Fiji's parliament last Thursday night by the Minister for Economy. Hopefully, we can identify the good, the bad, and the ugly aspects of the revised budget. As we begin, may I please request that, if you can, please share the SSTP page on your own timelines so that we may share this interview with Dr. Nilesh Gounder with as many interested people as possible. To ensure that you receive instant notifications for all future programs, please like the SSTP page and press the follow button as well. A big welcome to those who have joined us for the very first time and to th those rejoining us, welcome back. Sit back and for the next two hours and a bit, relax and be enlightened, hopefully, by this afternoon's program. Welcome to the Thinking People's Program, Sashi Singh's Talking Point, live on Facebook. As usual, we begin this episode, episode 14 of SSTP, as always, with a warm welcome to our regular contributor, Nikhil Singh, former Fiji TV journalist, to tell us of the key happenings of the political week in Fiji and in Australia. Nikhil, Bula, and welcome to SSTP. Very good afternoon to you. Bula Vinaka, good afternoon to you, uh, Sashi. All right. Well, uh, it's been a hectic week in Fiji, so to say. Uh, the big news, of course, is the revised budget delivered on Thursday evening. What has the reaction been, given the Minister for Economy said <laughs> only fools will object to the measures announced in the budget? Uh, yes, Sashi. Well, firstly, I think uh, there were no surprises, and we had discussed in the previous episode I did say that it was highly unlikely for the government to announce any austerity measures. I do understand that you will be discussing the revised budget uh, in depth with your chief guest today. Um, but I'll start off by saying that uh, the revised budget was introduced under Standing Order 51, in essence, a very limited time for debate and scrutiny. Uh, but talking about fools um, and the budget, some measures announced actually come into effect on the 1st of April. Uh, we know what the 1st of April is commonly known as, so let's wait and see if uh, the measures really eventuate. But the FTUC has fired one back on this. Um, the National Secretary of the uh, FTUC, Felix Anthony, uh, said in a statement, uh, and I quote, the minister so boldly declared that only fools would object to the increase in minimum wage, civil service salary review, reintroduction of overtime payment, etc. What he did not say was which fool in the first place had imposed all these taxes and objected to the reviews from taking place all these years. Uh, Felix Anthony goes on to say, the minister is only cleaning the mess he created years ago. He must not forget that he has single-handedly been minister of everything for the past 15 years and therefore cannot call anyone else a fool but himself. He said the Fiji Trade Union Congress recognizes the revised budget as one for the upcoming elections. Um, they said they recognize the difficult position that this government finds itself with the voters and the need for some desperate measures to win over voters. Uh, such in other reaction, uh, opposition member of parliament, Nico Noe Kula, uh, said the government has lied to the people of Fiji. In his budget response, Noe Kula said, and I quote, I'm telling the house that the government lied to the nation of the need to have a revised budget. The Financial Management Act only authorizes the government to do a revised budget when there is economic shock. For example, when we don't have enough money to take us to the end of the financial year. But the 
But there is no economic shock to necessitate a mini budget. The answer, in my view, is the government has embarked on a budget to authorize its election handouts, lying to the nation that there is a need for a revised budget when there is none and when even our laws don't authorize it. The Fiji Labour Party uh, has said people should not be taken in by the econ economy minister's sudden change of heart in removing vet from basic food and a range of other household items and the scrapping of the additional 20 cents a litre fuel tax. Uh, Chaudhry, uh, party leader Chaudhry said these concessions uh, were long overdue. People have been crying out for at least the past six years for some relief to the ever-rising cost of living through the removal of uh, vet on essentials. Uh, Chaudhry has questioned why the sudden compassion for um, our suffering people. He has asserted that this is nothing but a budget to bait the voters after years of neglect. Similarly, the National Federation Party leader, Biman Prasad, has termed it as the electionary budget of a pathetic leadership, too little, too late. Prasad added that the minister forgets that for more than three years, he didn't give a damn about the cries and pleas for help um, from the people, Sashi. Well, let me tell you, we will be having an in-depth look at the budget uh, with our chief guest, Dr. Nilesh Gounder, very shortly. Now, Nikhil, the value-added tax of VAT from some items has been removed. What are the details and is there any trade-off for the removal? Well, there is good news for all Fijians. VAT will be removed from basic food and a range of other household items. Um, 21 items in total, sashi, um, sugar, flour, rice, canned fish, cooking oil, um, potatoes, onion, garlic, baby milk, powdered milk, liquid milk, dal, tea, salt, kerosene, cooking gas, soap, soap powder, toilet paper, sanitary pads, and uh, toothpaste. So there's some relief coming um, their way. Uh, but is there an offset? Well, the FLP has said the removal of 9% VAT from basic food items and other household essentials is offset by the 15% VAT imposed on clothing, shoes, textiles, and a range of other goods and services. Um, uh, the party leader has said there is a clear trade-off uh, here. People will now be paying 6% more for clothing, uh, footwear, textiles, uh, amongst other things. Uh, uh, he said raising VET to 15% uh, to on a wide range of goods and services may be counterproductive to economic recovery, particularly where it affects professionals, uh, professional, scientific and technical services, Sashi. All right, and moving to another subject uh, which has featured prominently in the political debate, the national minimum wage. Government has made the announcement to increase the minimum wage, but it is taking a staggered approach. Tell us about this and also what is the response from the workers? Well, the government has finally come to party on this. The national minimum wage will be increased from the current $2.68 uh, cents to $4 an hour. But as he pointed out, Sashi, it will be done in four trenches, um, effective 1 April, 1st of April. The rate will go up to $3.01. From, from 1 July, it will be $3.34, $3.67 from 1 October, and the final increase to $4 from January 2023. The Fiji Trade Union Congress represented the workers, uh, which has fiercely advocated for an increase in the national minimum wage uh, for a number of years now. Uh, they claim the adjustment of $4 per hour announced in the revised budget is a clear deal between some employers and the government. Um, the uh, FTUC's Felix Anthony says, and I quote, while we firmly believe that the adjustment is long overdue, we shall have to wait for its implementation the $4 minimum wage is not effective until January 1, 2023, well after the elections. Okay, now there's some welcome news for tourists with changes to quarantine rules and also the relaxation of some other health measures as announced by the Minister for Economy. Um, I guess we may be able to travel to Fiji after all. Indeed, Sashi, in an effort to boost tourism, the three-night stay requirement at a government-approved hotel upon entry to Fiji is being removed. From the 7th of April, fully vaccinated visitor, visitors, residents or citizens of Fiji will only need to conduct a rapid antigen test within 24 hours of arrival in the country at an approved testing facility. 
Now, in other measures, I'm not sure if the economy minister shared his notes in cabinet because just a day before the revised budget announcement, the health minister told Fiji Village that mask wearing has to stay. But on Thursday evening, the Minister of Economy announced that from Friday to the next day, the wearing of masks will become optional um, and all venues uh, in, in other measures that are now being uh, relaxed, um, all venues, including stadiums, may operate at full capacity session. All right, now moving away from the revised budget, on Tuesday of last week, the Fiji Sun front page screamed with a headline, Police ready to prevent potential unrest. Now, in this article, the police commissioner referred to the coups of 1987 and 2000 as the country prepares for election this year. Has there been any reaction to this speculative story? Uh, yes, Ashi, it's a, it's a uh, headline that we haven't seen anywhere else, but uh, the, we, we have seen People's Alliance Party member and prominent civil lawyer Philemoni Bosarongo uh, posting on social media immediately after that uh, Tuesday. Um, he's called the headline a, a deplorable headline. Um, he's noted uh, on his social media handle, uh, and I quote, it is nothing short of instigating communal fear and public anxiety from a newspaper that has continued to misinform people by producing headlines which are pathetically driven to cause and perpetuate fear in people. Such as others have also questioned the motive and what appears to be the police commissioner's selective memory as he makes reference to the 1987 coup, but no mention of the illegal takeover of a democratically elected government in 2006. Indeed, a very notable exception. Now, closer to home, Nick Hill, uh, a Tasmanian senator has alleged that Prime Minister Scott Morrison had threatened her with jail time if she revealed a refugee deal with New Zealand. What is the story here? Yes, uh, another startling sort of uh, revelation here. The Guardian has reported that uh, Jackie Lambie, Senator Jackie Lambie, has alleged that the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, told her she risked jail time if she disclosed details of a secret deal that required the government to allow refugees to resettle in New Zealand in exchange for her support to repeal Australia's Medivac laws. The Tasmanian independent senator made the accusations about the quite threatening exchange in an interview with news.com.au, published hours after the Morrison government announced it would finally take up New Zealand's long-standing offer to resettle 150 refugees a year. Okay, now we have a new government in South Australia following elections last weekend. Uh, there were a couple of seats, including that of the former Liberal Premier Stephen Marshall, going right down to the wire. I understand he has managed to retain his seat, but the Liberals have lost one of their safest seats. What do you have on that? Yes, so actually Stephen Marshall, uh, Stephen Marshall, the former Premier, failed to return um, as the head of the government, as his government's run was ended just after one term. But the elections threw more problems for the former Premier as he struggled in his own seat. Um, you are right, he has managed to retain his seat uh, but uh, uh, it has, he has managed to do that with just a margin of um, under 500 votes, so very close. But the big news has come from the seat of weight. Uh, for the past 29 years, since the seat's formation in 1993, weight has been regarded as a blue ribbon seat and has never been in Labour hands. Um, the Labour Party has recorded a historic victory with their candidate, Catherine Hutchinson, seeing off the sitting uh, liberal turned independent candidate this now takes Labour to 27 seats in the 47-seat Parliament. All right, and at just 25 years of age, our Australian tennis star and world number one, Australia's little darling, has announced her shock re re uh, retirement this week. What's the score here? So actually, um, Ash Barty stunned the tennis world on Wednesday by announcing her departure from the sport, um, as you mentioned, at the age of 25. Um, she delivered the bombshell news in an interview with a very close friend um, and former tennis um, player, Casey Delequa, via social media channels. Um, Barty departs the sport at the peak of her powers as the reigning Australian Open and Wimbledon champion, um, who has held the world number one position since winning the French uh, Open in 2019. 
She did take an indefinite break in 2014, Sashi, but uh, Bari has said this time, um, and I quote, I know I've done this before, but in a very different feeling. And I'm so grateful for everything tennis has given me. It has given me all my dreams plus more, Shashi. <laughs> well, it just sort of makes me wonder whether there'll be another comeback because, uh, as you know, the uh, world-famous NFL player Tom Brady recently retired and just after 40-odd days announced he's coming back again. Well, Nikhil, thank you very, very much indeed uh, for your contribution this afternoon. As always, very nicely presented. Look forward to seeing you next week. Have a safe and a blessed week, Nikhil. Like this, Sashi. Thank you. Thank you once again. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point on Facebook Live. We ask the questions that Fijians all over the world want answers to. Fijians want to know. Please like and follow the SSTP page if you have not done so as yet. Well, now it's time to meet our chief guest on SSTP this afternoon. Dr. Nilesh Gounder is a senior lecturer in economics at the University of the South Pacific. He has a PhD in economics from Griffith University. Nilesh is also a center associate at the Development Policy Center Crawford School of Public Policy at the Australian National University. Beyond this, Nilesh has served as a member of UNESCAP Expert Group on Macroeconomic Prospects and Policy cha Challenges in Asia and the Pacific. He has also been a member of the Socioeconomic Impact Assessment of COVID-19 in the Pacific Task Force for 2020, which was established by the Forum Economic Ministers to oversee the design and delivery of a region-wide socioeconomic impact assessment of COVID-19 pandemic for the region. Nilesh Gounder is also a trustee of the Fiji Women's Rights Movement, member of the Academic Council at the Sangam College of Nursing and Health Sciences, and chairman of the TISI Sangam Education Board, which manages 21 primary and five secondary schools in Fiji. It is now my pleasure to welcome our chief guest for this afternoon, Dr. Nilesh Gounder. Good afternoon, Dr. Gounder, and uh, welcome to Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Hello, Nilesh, can you hear us? Yes, Sashi, good afternoon, yes. and uh, thank you for having me on your show. Well, wonderful. I'm glad we've got that connection going. Well, uh, look, thank you very much for agreeing to be our guest this afternoon. It's a pleasure having you on the show. I really look forward to a very robust discussion with you. But uh, as I always do, I like to begin things with uh, discussing my guest's background. And uh, you will be no exception this afternoon. And uh, to begin with, how would you describe your early beginnings? Yeah, thank you, Sashi. Uh, so I, I grew up in, in, in an area known as Momi Bay uh, in Nandronga. That's where I was born. And I attended my primary school there. And um, and then I I had to attend my high school in Nandi. And after that, uh, I moved uh, on to tertiary education. And uh, I joined USP as a, as a tutor, uh, which is now a teaching assistant uh, in, in 2004. And then uh, in 2008, I, I went to Australia to do my PhD and I came back in 2014 and I joined um, USP again uh, in, the, in the School of, um, School of Economics. And uh, I, I grew up in a very rural community and um, the, the main, main occupation by people in that community uh, was mainly uh, sugarcane farming. So, so I come from a background uh, where I, I first and so poverty and, 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 and the challenges that, that, that people face, uh, especially in rural areas and those who are engaged uh, in, in, in agriculture. And, and one of the things that, that always was on my mind uh, since, since, uh, since growing up uh, was um, uh, how does one remove um, the challenges that, that, that people face in terms of uh, living a, a better quality life or 
how does one improve the quality of life uh, of of, uh, of of a country or a nation? So, w- with this um, with these uh, ideas always uh, being being in my mind, and you know, economics was always uh, one of the things that that I look forward to uh, to 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 study and and to see uh, what answers can economics provide in terms of uh, better design of policies, etc., to improve the the lives of the people. All right. Well. You, you mentioned you were educated in Nandi. If I may ask you, which secondary school did you attend? So I attended Swami Vivekananda College. At the that fam- time, it was Vivekananda High School. The, the famous uh, SVHS. Yes, those days. Yeah. Yes, I also went to school in Nandi at Nandi College, and uh, we were devout school enemies, as you say. <laughs> great, great yeah. co- competitors between the two schools. Now, uh, during my generation, that was the same story. So, always is, always is. Yeah. Um, now, who was it that inspired you very early in your life, and why? My parents have played a very influential role. I mean, uh, my my dad uh, went to school up to to class one, and my mother uh, studied up to class seven. But um, they were very articulate, and and they, they, they taught us. Uh, important values about um, work ethics and 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 we i also come from a very re- religious family so you know the the religious are bringing as well as um, uh, the, the values that 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 our parents inculcated in in us uh, had, had a very important role uh, in in where i am i am today and especially the work ethics uh, that that uh, i always uh, aim to 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 to, uh, to possess uh, has been uh, has been derived from from watching my parents uh, uh, doing the hard yards uh, to 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 meet the family ends. Okay, you mentioned economics. Uh, when did you get interested in economics as a subject, and what was it that attracted you to this field of study? So I, I think growing up, I, I saw that the, the challenges of poverty and and the hardships that people go through. Uh, when 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 people live in in poverty and and, and the challenges that that that, that children face, uh, especially those who come from from low income households or, or, or backgrounds, so uh, I, I always wanted to 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 do something uh, to find answers or solutions to 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 some of these um, these challenges that 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 uh, that households face, and I always wanted to was eager to find out uh, what is going to make an economy more prosperous. How can we make a nation more prosperous? Uh, and and uh, what are the challenges uh, that that a country like Fiji faces? And what are the solutions, or strategies uh, that may be required in order to address the challenges that 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 uh, I saw people facing firsthand? Some of the the challenges still remain. Poverty, for instance, still a, a big problem in Fiji, and I'm sure we'll discuss about this later. But um, you know, coming out of of a rural area and and seeing firsthand the challenges people face was was one of the the, the reasons why why I really wanted to get into economics because at the time uh, economics was at the forefront of of some of the, the debates and discussions in terms of um, uh, finding solutions to the challenges that developing countries face. But during high school, uh, I also started reading some of the opinion pieces uh, in the especially in the Fiji Times by Professor Warden Nasi. And, and uh, I was amazed by, by 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 his arguments and by his analysis and the solutions he proposed. So that was one of the reasons, and, and that actually enhanced my interest uh, in, in in studying um, studying economics. And and when I joined USP, and when I published my first opinion piece, uh, I, I invited Professor Warden Nasi to come and have coffee with me. And then I told him why I invited him, and that um, I always had a dream. That um, that one day, I would be sitting with um, with uh, with an economist like you, and and talk to you. This was um, my my high school dream, and uh, that that uh, eventually materialized uh, uh, when I, when I joined joined USP. So it's always been part of this 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 looking forward to to doing something and 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 finding finding solutions to 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 challenges that that. Um, that our people face, and how do we make our communities uh, a better place, and improving the the lives and living standards uh, of of our uh, households and communities. 
Wonderful. And uh, of course, uh, Professor Wadden Narsi uh, is a friend of this program as well, known him for many, many years. And uh, hopefully one of these days we will have him as a chief guest as well. Now today, Nilesh, you are a senior lecturer in economics at the University of the South Pacific. How do you find this experience? I think I'm, I'm really privileged uh, given that I'm in the academia and uh, I don't regret the choice that I made many years ago to join the academia because uh, I get all the freedom to explore uh, the questions that I always wanted to, to look at in terms of uh, economic policies, the challenges that, that uh, Fiji and other developing countries in the region face, uh, doing research in terms of finding out what would be the policies and strategies to deal with these uh, these challenges and and the end goal is is always economic policies are, are not an end in itself the end goal of economic policies uh, are to improve the lives of the people so uh, the, the freedom that 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 we have uh, in universities in terms of uh, not only teaching and learning side of things but the the research side of things as well and and trying to, to look for, for for answers and and our ability to to to, to critique freely and, and, and disseminate uh, our analysis and understanding and knowledge uh, to, the, to, the, to the people uh, of Fiji and, and within, the, within the region. I mean, I always look at um, uh, from the perspective that uh, my salary is paid by the taxpayers of the region and, and our, our allegiance to the taxpayers in terms of doing independent and critical analysis uh, so that uh, the public is more informed and, and have another view or opinion of, of uh, the many uh, economic um, uh, policies or economic ideologies or strategies that, that are out there. All right, well, uh, congratulations on your achievements to date. Uh, you came, as you said, uh, from a rural farming family. You mentioned poverty. We'll discuss national poverty shortly, but uh, congratulations uh, uh, for all your achievements to date. Uh, and uh, I wish you very well uh, for the future as well. Well, let us now move our discussions to the main agenda for today. And uh, that is to look, analyze, and dissect the revised budget handed down in Fiji's parliament by the Minister for Economy and the Attorney General, Aya Sayed Kayum, last Thursday night. Now, let me begin by saying government's total revenue is estimated at $2.25 billion, while total expenditure is $3.72 billion for the 2021-2022 revised budget. This will result in a net deficit of $1.46 billion, equivalent to 14.2% of GDP. Now, Nilesh, what is your first impression of the revised budget? Thanks, Ashia. I think, firstly, uh, my question is: is the need for a revised budget in the in the, in, in the first place? Because uh, when I when I looked at the data uh, for the first six months of the 2021-2022 fiscal year, uh, I realized that the, the government revenue. Uh, was actually the actual revenue for the first six months was uh, was higher than the, um, the forecast of the 2021-2022 budget that was laid down um, in last year. And then uh, the total expenditure for the six, first six months of the 2021-2022 fiscal year uh, was actually 1.6 billion uh, compared to the forecast of, of 2.1 uh, billion. And, and what that shows is that revenue collection was higher for the six months, which means that it's 23% higher than, than the forecasted uh, amount. Similarly, on the expenditure front, uh, there was an underspending of, of around $440 million for the first, uh, for the first six months. So uh, I, I don't really see the need for a revised budget at this point in time. The government could have continued on, on, on its, uh, on its uh, current trajectory for the next next six months, and 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 uh, uh, could have could have um, could uh, there so there was no need for a for a revised budget at, at this particular uh, at this particular point in in time. So, based on 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 the on the on the actual revenue and the forecasted revenue and the actual expenditure and the forecasted expenditure for the first six months, 
I don't really see the need for a for a for a for a revised budget. And and to me, it seems more of a, of of a pre-election strategy rather than rather than a genuine attempt to revise the revenues and expenditures to boost um, to boost economic recovery because the government could have continued uh, along the current path and it would have it wouldn't have been any 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 crisis or or, or, or difficulty uh, until until July when it would have uh, presented the 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 budget for 2022 and uh, fiscal uh, fiscal uh, fiscal year. I find it amazing. I mean, you've just mentioned that uh, the government had $440 million, uh, uh, which was an under expenditure. I mean, that money was available, was it not, to spend perhaps uh, on much, much needed infrastructure, etc. Well, this is one of the things we have. This is not the first time, but we have seen in previous cases as well uh the actual uh, or the the budgeted expenditures don't actually materialize uh during the um, during the fiscal year and uh, there is hardly uh people actually go back and look at what was budgeted in the last fiscal year and what has actually been implemented so for that reason uh, when budgets are presented or during budget speech uh, there may be a lot of rhetoric in terms of what is to be done and the amount of expenditure that's allocated. But uh, what really happens uh, is important. And uh, whether the, the, the budgeted expenditures actually materialize or are spent on what it is supposed to be spent is really important in terms of the budget having its, having its full, full impact. So this is not the first time that, that we are seeing this. This is this has become kind of a norm where where budget is presented, we have uh, a forecast of um, uh, revenue, and then we are given uh, an estimation of, of expenditures. But um, uh, when revenues don't materialize, we usually see uh, expenditures, uh, some expenditures uh, being reversed over the fiscal year. But in this case, it's really surprising because here, uh, the actual revenue is actually more than the forecast which is 23% is more than the forecast. But surprisingly, uh, the expenditure is, has been underspent for the first six months by $440 million. Uh, I mean, one of the, uh, one of the things which is, which is there is sometimes um, the capacity to spend the allocated money in the budget may take some time, uh, given that, that uh, how different government ministries or departments approach uh, their the expenditure allocation but but despite that uh, and, and 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 given that there is a revised budget uh, this uh, all seems um, uh, very surprising uh, given that there is a revised budget at this particular uh, point in time uh, and, and and considering the actual revenue uh, collections for for the first 6 months and the actual expenditure for the for the first 6 months uh, i don't see a need for a revised budget at this point in this point in time there wasn't really a shortfall in, in 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 actual revenue collections if there was a shortfall in actual revenue collections uh vis-a-vis -vis the forecast we could have said yes there is a need now to 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 to, to have a revised budget now uh, some people might say look um, there was a need to to reduce vet on 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 basic food items and etc this could have also been done without the need for a revised budget uh, separate bills could have been presented to parliament where uh, vet on 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 the essential items could have been could have been reduced uh, the minimum wages too minimum wage is not part of the budget uh, it's got uh, nothing to do with the with the budget it's not a budget budgetary policy measure so the government has tied together the, the minimum wage issue uh, with this uh, with this budget announcement, but there was no no need for it. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that uh, we could have still the government could have still implemented uh, zero VAT on, on 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 basic food items and uh, implemented the minimum wage without the need to present this revised uh, budget. Let me assure you, Nilesh, that we will dissect the budget step by step, we'll unpack a number of things. 
Now, uh, before we discuss a number of specific issues regarding the economy and the recently revised national budget, can you perhaps provide a review of the performance of the Fijian economy, say, during the last 10 years? That, I believe, uh, is important as it will, it will set the standard for a comparative discussion this afternoon. Uh Thanks, Shashi. Yeah. So, if you look at, I'll, I'll go uh, with the with the economic indicator indicator that's that's very popular among the economics uh, and and the public and the media, and that's the that's the GDP GDP growth rates. So, uh, the uh, after the 2006 coup, uh, the full impact of the coup was felt in 2007, 8, and 9, and those were the the the, the low growth. Yes, and 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 the interim government actually struggled uh, for the for the first few years after the 2006 coup, but with the with the with the new constitution and and the impending elections in 2013, uh, there's some confidence that was brought back, and and uh, the projects that were in the pipeline were actually implemented after the the 20, 2014 elections. So we did see slightly higher growth rates in 20, 2014, 2015. Uh, 2016 up to 2017, the, those four years we did see slightly higher growth rates, and and uh, I would link that to the to the fact that uh, elections had taken place, and that uh, there was uh, relatively more certainty uh, given that um, elections had taken place. There was a democratic uh, government in parliament, uh, however you look at it, and that uh, businesses would have would have seen. Uh, would have seen uh, more more confidence uh, in the in the economy, given that uh, the policy makings were in a setting uh, where there was an opportunity for for opposition to debate and ask questions, etc. So that that would have brought more more certainty. However, uh, and and the government was also spending heavily uh, during those years. So so a lot of growth was also driven by by government spending as well, and. The, the, the government had also sent indicators uh, across the economy uh, that the economy is expanding and, and we are going to boost the economy through fiscal policy, et cetera, and that uh, the economy will, con will is expected to continue to grow. And as a result, banks also expanded their lending, which also played a role uh, in the in the early part of, of uh, uh, immediately after the after the 2014 uh, elections. But the steam slowly began to begin to rain out uh, and and uh, glow, growth had started to slow down uh, by by 2018 and we, we recorded uh, a lower growth rate uh, compared to 2017 in 2018 of 3.8% and then 2019 growth had gone down uh, to, to to close to 0% uh, and uh, so this is this is before covid uh, the full impact of of covid-19 was felt in fiji beginning from march 2020 but the economy had already started to slow down in in 20 2019 and uh, 2020 uh, the impact for covid was 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 big was massive uh, the the economy uh, grew by negative uh, 15.2% and then 2021 uh, negative 4.1% the forecast for this year is uh, is 11.3% and uh, the forecast for next year uh, is um, is 8.8.5 um, 8 uh, 5% and uh, so, so uh, it's clear that the economy had, 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 had started to slow down even well before before COVID COVID nineteen, and I also want to highlight uh, business confidence indicators. This is uh, data that's collected by the by the Reserve Bank of Fiji, and uh, we had already seen a decline in business confidence uh, starting in in June June twenty eighteen. This is uh, just prior to the to the twenty eighteen elections in November. And business con confidence started to fall in June 2018. It continued to fall until uh, until December 2019. And in December 2019, business confidence was at its lowest that it it had been uh, in the last last uh, last 10 years. So between 2000 2009 to 2019, business confidence was at its lowest in 2019. And and. So that 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 is in line with the with the low GDP uh, growth rate that that we are seeing. So business confidence and economic growth uh, indicators all uh, had started to, to to decline and and show uh, signs of an economy that was um, 
that was uh, that was slowing down. Now, Cyclone Winston had an impact, but that was way back in 2016. The growth rate was uh, could have been higher, but uh, because of that, it was lower. But I'm talking about uh, you know 2017, 2018. We did have higher growth rates, but um, beyond that, uh, the economy had, had, had slowed down, uh, beginning from from 20, uh, 2019. Okay, now you mentioned that uh, growth rates, for example, 2018, the growth rate uh, went down. 2019, you said it was 0%. What would be the key factor? This is pre-COVID we're talking about. What would be the key factor for the growth rate to be in such a decline pattern? So, uh, uh as I mentioned a while ago, one of the things that, that provides um, an indication is, is the level of business confidence, which had started to, to decline just before 2018 uh, elections, because um, uh, you know elections uh, can be sensitive in Fiji and, and uh, political confidence is really important. So political confidence and political stability is strongly linked to business confidence, but also uh, consumer confidence uh, as, as as investor confidence as well. So uh, I think uh, it was linked to to elections, but uh, even the election after elections, we continued to see uh, the, the 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 business confidence uh, decline until until uh, until December until November or December uh, 20, uh, 2019. So uh, at the same time, we also saw cost of doing business had gone up uh, and uh, invest. Uh, investment as a portion of GDP had also started to uh, it also started to uh, to decline. So, uh, for instance, uh, the the investment to GDP uh, was at a high of around twenty five percent in twenty thirteen, but it had gone down to to twenty to fifteen percent of GDP uh, by 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 twenty nineteen, which meant that um, uh, businesses weren't spending uh, in towards investment. Uh, as they were doing five or six years ago. So uh, with low investment, uh, if there's low investment, that will certainly uh, factor in, uh, in terms of the growth rates that we that we achieve. So cost of doing business, uh, low investment rates, uh, business confidence, consumer confidence, all of these are linked together. And all of this can play an important role in terms of uh, the impact on, on economic activity and, and, uh, and the level of incomes that are earned uh, in the country, and, and as a result, on the on the GDP growth rates um, that we saw in 2019. Okay, you you've mentioned gross domestic product GDP and GDP growth rates. Well, at this juncture, I'm also reminded of a famous debate where the question was, "What is GDP?" We'll leave that there for a while. Uh, Dr. Gounder, can you please explain why do economists give prominence to GDP growth rates? So GDP is, is, uh, is gross domestic product, and it's one of the, the foremost indicators because it basically is an average measure of, of the, the incomes that is uh, earned in the country. So when we say total GDP, that would be the total incomes uh, that is earned in a country during a given period of time, and it's usually uh, for, for a given year, for, from January 1st to December uh, 31st. So if, the, if the, the total income that is earned in a country increases, that shows that uh, more incomes are being earned, uh, which would be linked to higher economic activity, higher investment levels, higher consumption, etc. So GDP is one of the foremost indicators that, that, that economists use to figure out uh, the, the economic progress or reverse uh, of, of a nation over a period of time. It's not a, a perfect measure. But it's the best that we have uh, for now in terms of uh, having a broad indicator that, uh, that can tell us uh, the direction of, of economic activity. And these indicators are very important even for a, a country like Fiji? Yes, uh, of course. Uh, it's a very important uh, indicator and, 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 and uh, the, 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 the forecasting of GDP and the actual GDP rates provide very, very important information in terms of the level of economic activity and the economic progress or the reversal of a nation. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point and our chief guest this afternoon 
is Dr. Nilesh Gounder, Senior Lecturer in Economics at the University of the South Pacific. Please share the SSTP page and this interview with family and friends if you can. Don't forget to like and follow the SST page as well. Well, as I said in the introduction, government's total revenue is estimated at $2.25 billion, while total expenditure is $3.72 billion for this revised budget for 2021-2022. Minister for Economy, Ayaz Sayed Kayum, says this will result in a net deficit of $1.46 billion, equivalent to 14.2% of the GDP. Can you please explain to our viewers what does this mean in layman's terms, in very simple terms? An explanation, please. So uh, uh, a budget is basically a government plan for, 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 for fiscal year. And the fiscal year is usually for, for, for 12 months. So governments collect revenues and then they spend uh the, the money that they collect on public services and and, and uh, policies and other strategies etc so if the if the government expenditure is more than the than the than the revenue government has actually collected there is a deficit which means that your expenditure is more than more than the revenue and uh, the difference between the expenditure and revenue when we compare it to the revenue is the is the is the is the percentage uh percent of deficit with re respect to the revenue. But we also use the, um, the, the difference between revenue and expenditure with respect to GDP as well. So that gives us uh, a deficit with, uh, with relative to, to, to GDP. So we are able to compare what's the difference between revenue and expenditure uh, with expenditure being more than revenue uh, with, uh, with respect, to, with respect to, the, to the GDP. Okay, now an important question that arises is how will the government account for this deficit of $1.46 billion? So when there is a, there is a deficit, uh, then governments need to go and borrow to cover the shortfall. And the shortfall is there simply because the, go the government is spending more than the revenue it has, it has, it has collected or the expenditure is, is, is more than the, the revenue. And governments can borrow from a number of sources. They can they can borrow from domestic uh, sources, or they can go abroad and borrow. If they borrow from domestic sources, uh, commercial banks is one of the sources they can borrow from. But in Fiji, uh, a convenient source for for governments has been uh, Fiji National Provident Fund. It collects uh, uh, pension uh, savings from from members, and therefore. Uh, it has a it has a, a large pool of savings that that uh, that it has, and and it's always looking for opportunities to invest, and therefore, uh, government goes and 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 borrows money from from FNPF, but they also borrow uh, they can also borrow from insurance companies um, as well, and um, if they don't want to borrow domestic uh, from domestic sources for some reason, then governments can always go and borrow offshore. Or they can also borrow from uh, borrowing from offshore would also mean borrowing from multilateral um, or regional institutions. So multilateral institutions such as the World Bank and regional institutions such as the, such as the IMF. Uh, sorry, such as the ADB. So, in other words, to clear this deficit of 1.46 billion dollars, the solution is go and borrow some more money. Yes, exactly. So every cent of that deficit is going to be borrowed, which has, which government has been doing so far, and all governments uh, do that. We'll explore the debt situation further down during this uh, session today. Now, the Minister for Economy has also said that the government debt is projected to reach 88.6% by the end of this fiscal year. And based on the projected economic recovery, and planned deficit reduction, the debt to GDP ratio is expected to come down to below 80% in the next three years. Well, Dr. Gander, they say the proof is in the pudding. While the Minister for Economy says the figure is 88.6%, the Asian Development Bank report states that the government currently forecasts that public debt will peak at a record level of 
91.6% of GDP in this financial year, 2022. Again, in simple English, if I may please ask you, what does this mean for the people of Fiji? So uh, the, 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 the percentage of GDP that you mentioned is usually relative to the percentage of, of nominal GDP. So uh, uh, it, the, the, the GDP rate that, that you usually hear uh, in the media or, or economics talk about is the real GDP. But the nominal GDP uh, it takes inflation into account. Given, given your audience, Sashi, I wouldn't be going into the technical details of the difference between these two, but uh, uh, the, the, the GDP ratio basically is, is sorry, the, the debt to GDP ratio is, is, is the total debt divided by, by the nominal GDP. Uh, so uh, if, if you forecast a higher nominal GDP, then you will definitely show that um, the debt ratio relative to GDP is, is, is lower. So as you because the, the, the numerator you have is, is, the, is the total debt and the denominator is the nominal GDP. And then you multiply that by 100 to get a percentage uh, of GDP. So if, if, your, if your denominator goes up, then, then you have a lower uh, percentage as your answer. So uh, if, you use, uh, if one uses, uh, or if, if two people use two different nominal GDPs, then you are likely to have two different uh, percentage of, of, of debt to GDP, GDP ratio. So I'm not sure what, uh, what uh, nominal GDP that, that the ADB used in, in, in the context that you just, just mentioned, but yes, using uh, different nominal GDPs will give you a different uh, GDP to debt that ratio is one of those traditional ratios that we are still continuing to use. It's, it's not really a, a very perfect way to look at uh, the debt scenario of a, of a country because uh, the nominal GDP uh, will also consist of um, not only changes in, 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 in real goods and services that is produced in the economy, but it also consists of the inflation rate uh, throughout the year. So given that this year we are, it is forecasted that inflation rate will be higher, uh, because of the of the supply chain disruptions and and the Russia Ukraine war and its spillover effects, uh, the nominal GDP forecast maybe 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 higher. So if, if there is a higher inflation rate, we'd expect nominal GDP to to to, to be higher. So a higher nominal GDP will automatically reduce the the debt to GDP ratio. But that's one story. I think what's important is to 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 also look at. The, the nominal value of the debt that's the actual value of the debt because that has to be that has to be paid uh, that has to be paid uh, paid back it, it is it is convenient to 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 look at um, gdp relative to uh, sorry debt relative to gdp because you 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 get some idea as to what's your total debt and what's the economy's ability to earn incomes uh, in a in a given year but uh, it's, it's it's not really a perfect uh, perfect way to look at it because uh, the nominal GDP against which the debt is being compared uh, can contain underlying vulnerabilities. So, given the the take Fiji for instance, we are a small island state. We are vulnerable to natural natural disasters, etc. So, if there is one shock and it can take away some of the development gains that we have made, or a shock that can have an impact on economic activity and GDP for a for a particular fiscal year, then there goes our, our GDP to debt, debt ratio. So um, uh, the, the underlying assumption or the underlying argument behind the debt to GDP ratio uh, is based on, 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 on the vulnerabilities or the lack of it uh, within the, the, the forecasted GDP uh, of a country. And that's why a GDP, uh, sorry, a debt of nine, 9 billion for Fiji uh, would be very different say uh, a debt of 9 billion for Mauritius or for any other economy because we need to factor in the, the, the economic vulnerabilities of a nation when you look at uh, its debt uh, in, 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 in total. So I think a more, more appropriate figure uh, would be to, to, to go beyond the debt to GDP ratio and look at what economic vulnerabilities uh, exist in, in a specific economy and take those also into account in terms of looking at uh, its total debt and its ability to meet those obligations at, 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 at required times in the, in the, in the future.
Okay, a wonderful explanation. Let's leave GDP behind for a moment. I know you've touched on uh, the economy uh, for the last 10 years, and you did mention that uh, 2018, the growth went down. 2019, it was uh, 0% uh, growth. Um, I just want to reaffirm this next uh, question. So this budget is against the backdrop of COVID-19 and its impact. So the status of the economy in 2019, as you mentioned, with 0% growth, um, that is pre-COVID. So we can't really blame COVID for the status of the economy currently, can we? So, yes, uh, as, as we discussed earlier, uh, going back to 2019, the GDP growth rate uh, was negative 0.4%. And 2018, 3.8%. 2017, 5.4%. Let's take 2016 out for a while because of Winston and, 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 and the impact on the economy. But uh, the economy had, 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 had uh, quickly uh, rebound by, by 2017 uh, uh, because agriculture was mostly mostly impacted and, and, and the, the, the path of the cyclone did not uh, largely impact the, the tourism industry. The tourism industry was largely uh, safe uh, in the, in, in the, because of the Winston. But there were was, there was some, some areas which were definitely impacted. So the economy was able to make a quick rebound. And, and also the support that was received from donors, etc., played a role in, in ensuring that we quickly rebound. Uh, uh, from from the from the natural disaster, but by 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 2018 there were signs of the economy economy slowing down, and and we saw that in 2019. And I think what happened was, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's a number of factors. Reforms had slowed down, and, and uh, you know I usually I usually write uh, an analysis of uh, after every budget, and and I, I remember putting this down uh, after the the 2018 budget uh, and and i talked about uh, that deeper reforms will now be required moving forward in order to to raise growth rates even higher we can't be engaged in doing business as usual so cost of doing business etc we need to to relook at our industries especially target um, export based industries look at where our competitive advantages are and to ensure that these industries are growing because if you look at fiji's market size our population is is uh, slightly over 800,000 people. So if our firms sell within our borders, then they, they can only tap into a, a population size of, of 800 something thousand people. Therefore, we need our businesses to go abroad to sell in other countries so they're able to tap into a larger market size. And as businesses go beyond borders, they're able to capture a larger market size or larger uh, population. They sell more, businesses expand, uh, demand for goods and services increase, uh, businesses expand, more uh, people are employed, so employment increases, household incomes increase, etc. So they, we need to see, ensure that there's a sustained increase in exports. And, and those are the kinds of reforms uh, that, that we need to continue. But we didn't see that coming through uh, up, until, up until 2018. Much of growth that, was, that we saw in 2015, 16 and 17 we actually actually driven by large government large government spending so government spending can drive growth only so far because growth must really come from the private sector private sector is the engine of growth and and therefore uh, we need reforms that allows the private sector to grow and expand our our, our public sector uh, is, is 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 generally or in pacific island countries the public sector in terms of employment is generally bigger than the uh, uh, generally bigger than other countries. But, but let, let, me, let me, hold on, let me stop you there for a moment, please. All I was trying to establish was just uh, perhaps a reaffirmation. You did mention that in 2019, there was 0% growth. And all I wanted to establish was that the status of Fiji's economy currently cannot be blamed on COVID, which more or less started uh, really seriously in March 2020. So, because the economy in 2019 was zero growth, as you've said. So it was already an, an affected, uh, affected economy. So would I be right with my assumptions that you can't yes, blame yes. it on COVID? 
Ex exactly. Yeah, that's what I was driving at. And and the right. fault lines had already been been exposed just before COVID. And and one of the fault lines was that there was an over reliance on tourism. So tourism contributes to 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 GDP uh, yeah. an amount uh, say close to forty percent, both directly and indirectly. So you can imagine uh, the reliance on one industry for such a such a huge uh, coverage of of GDP. And and uh, certainly. Uh, the fact that uh, we needed uh, diversification and, 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 and moving forward, diversification should be an important part of the strategy and, and allowing the agriculture sector uh, to grow and, and, and expand. And when, when we talk about poverty, uh, as you mentioned, you, have, you might have a question later on. I can explore more poverty in agriculture. Yep. Wonderful. Now, given the economic status, was the government in a position to handle this without support from outside? Yeah, thanks, Sashi. Uh, it would have been set really difficult for the for the government to to handle this uh, without uh, without support from uh, from the from the outside. So, for instance, just more recently in December twenty twenty one, Australia and New Zealand combined gave one hundred eighty five million. Direct budgetary support. So this was not uh, this was not loans, but this was direct uh, direct budget support. And during the last two fiscal years, that's uh, 2020, 2021, and 2021 and 2022, Australia and New Zealand have provided over 400 million in cash grants. And these were really important because government revenue had taken a hit because of the of, of the impact of uh, of of COVID nineteen. So this was um, this was really uh, this was really important, and and uh, I don't see how the government could have could have managed to to continue uh, spending the amount that it has been able to spend during the the COVID uh, during the COVID uh, times, say 2020 and 2021. Uh, given that it it had to maintain uh, expenditure uh, to a certain level to continue providing government uh, or public services, especially in the area of uh, of health. But beyond beyond the direct budget support that has come to the government, uh, significant support has also gone to to civil society organisations uh, to provide uh, those services which the state uh, would have generally provided. So, for instance, uh, direct support has been given to Friends uh, and uh, TSA Sangam, who have uh, liaised to work very closely with the Ministry of Health during the height of the of the COVID. COVID pandemic. So beyond the beyond the budget, uh, uh, the actual budgetary support, uh, the support that was given by Australia, New Zealand, and European Union to 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 the, um, the civil society organisations also played an, an important role. Otherwise, the the, the the government would have found it uh, very very challenging uh, to deal uh, with um, with the impact of the of the crisis. I'll just give you one one. One, one example. So, for instance, in 2020, 2021 budget, the government received 250 million in aid in cash towards budget support from Australia, New Zealand, and other development partners. And that 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 uh, 250 million actually accounted for 12 percent of total government revenue, and and that played an important role in in reducing the the net deficit for 2020 2021. Because if government had had kept its expenditure at the at the level, but had not received this budget support, then its deficit would have been much higher. So it would have had to go uh, go and borrow the two hundred million dollars uh, if it, it had not received this grant in the 2020 2021 uh, budget. So uh, you know, it played a very very important role. And and uh, uh, without this support, the government would have found it very very challenging to 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 meet some of the, its commitments. Uh, towards uh, providing uh, public services. All right. Now, as stated earlier, the Minister for Economy stated that the debt-to-GDP ratio is expected to come down to below 80% in the next three years. Do you think, uh, Dr. Gounder, do you think this is achievable given the current state of things in Fiji, given Fiji's economy as it stands now? That's an excellent question, Sashi. And uh, I think it's, it's, let's look at the growth rates that have been forecasted uh, for this year 
uh, and for, for, for next year. So this year, the, the growth rate has been forecast to be around 11.3%, which, uh, which looks high. But we must remember that we are starting from a very low, low base. And the low base being that in 2020, there was a negative growth rate of 20, 20%, uh, sorry, negative growth rate of 15.2% in 2020. And in 2021, there was a negative growth rate of 4.1%, uh, uh, which means that we, we're starting from a very low growth rate. When you start from a very low base, then the, the, the positive growth rate after that is likely to be, to be, to be higher mathematically. So what we are basically seeing here, no real gain, but it's just an, just an outcome because of the fact that we are starting from a low, low base. So yes, the nominal GDP is going to look uh, as if it's growing. And, and therefore, when, when debt is compared against nominal GDP, it will certainly look, uh, will be lesser if nominal GDP continues to grow. But as I mentioned earlier, the, the, when we look at the, the uh, debt to nominal GDP ratio is really looking at the, the underlying vulnerabilities uh, of, of the economy as a whole. What economy are we talking about? Uh, take Fiji, uh, uh, Fiji's economy, a small island state. Uh, we have, uh, we rely, over reliance on tourism of around 40%. And manufacturing sector hasn't grown the way uh, it was supposed to, to grow. We are vulnerable to natural disasters. Uh, climate change uh, uh, can also impact uh, through uh, the economy, uh, through droughts and, 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 and severe weather conditions, etc. So those vulnerabilities, I think, are, are really important. And, and uh, if so, that negative 15.2 percent decline that we saw in 2017. If you want to take the economy back to that same level, pre-COVID level, then just 15.2 percent growth rate is not enough. Mathematically, we need around 17% growth rate for, for us to take the economy back to the pre-COVID pre level. So the recovery is just about the pre-COVID level. And, and uh, it will certainly take uh, three to five years uh, for, for the Fijian economy to go back uh, to the, to the pre-COVID level in real terms. If we want to, to see some real growth uh, taking the economy back to the pre-COVID uh, COVID level. Okay, well, I was going to say, if we remove the percentages and just look at a simple construction in a sentence form, my understanding would be that uh, the Minister for Economy is saying that Fiji is now on the recovery path following the last three years of uh, consecutive economic decline. And the Minister for Economy has said that a double-digit growth of 11.3% is projected for 2022, possibly the highest ever growth in Fiji's post-independence history. Now, you've mentioned if we go back to pre-COVID levels, we're looking at around about 15-odd percent. Um, given the minister has said 11.3 percent, let's stick to his figures. Do you think this is achievable? Uh it depends a lot on the assumptions that have been made. So I've, I've been reading the budget documents. Uh, you know, one of the assumptions that have been made is, is based on the tourism arrivals forecast uh, for this year, because tourism is very important uh, given the, the the current context of the economy to drive economic activity and 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 um, and, and uh, have an impact on on the GDP that is being being forecasted. So a lot hinges on the assumptions that have been made in regards to the. To, to the drivers of, of, of economic recovery. So tourism would, is, is indeed one of the, the important drivers. So a lot depends on the, on, on, on the number of tourists that, that actually receive, uh, Fiji receives uh, for the balance of this, um, of this year, or at least for the next, uh, next six months until, uh, until July. And uh, you, know, you also mentioned the, the economic recovery uh, of the last three years. I, I would, Put it as the economic recovery of the last two years because we are talking about 2020 and 2021. 2019 mm -hmm. is not really uh, and and and, and um, a COVID related decline. So I think uh, to to put um, uh, for anyone to put that, 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 that the recovery within the context of dating it back to 2019 is misleading. It's really about the recovery that that we should be talking about uh, as a result of COVID from 2020 and 2021 and moving forward 
into into 2022 and onwards. Well, like you said, I mean, when you talk about highest growth rates, etc., there's always a potential downside risks to this kind of outlook. And uh, you you mentioned uh, tourism, for example. Well, that is the biggest uh, factor is the uncertain pace of recovery from the tourism industry, because with tourism is associated the recovery of the overall economy, jobs, and economic stability for the country. Now, given the these sort of risk factors, I mean, I asked you whether it was achievable. Now my question is, given these sort of risk factors, do you think that the projected growth rate is far-fetched? I mean, 11.3% for 2022. Are we being realistic? Yes, uh, Sashi, I think uh, it all, once again, depends on the on the assumptions that have been made. Uh, I have my doubts about the 11.3%, uh, but let's wait and see uh, how the actual uh, drivers uh, that have been assumed to contribute to, to, to GDP turn out. And one major challenge I, I see beyond the tourism arrivals is inflation, actually, which may, which may uh, have an impact on negatively impacting um, some of the growth uh, forecasts because of the spillovers from the Russia-Ukraine war and the supply chain disruptions, etc. Um, the inflation rate is, uh, I think, has been forecasted, uh, if I'm correct, to around 4% by the end of the year, which is which is generally higher than the 2 to 3% that, that central banks in the region target. And if inflation exceeds 4%, that will definitely have an impact on the on the growth uh, growth forecast for, for, for 2020. Too. But you're right. Um, if tourism numbers don't don't uh, don't materialize, uh, then they'll certainly uh, will impact the the growth um, uh, growth 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 forecast for for 2022. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, the Thinking People's Program. We ask questions that Fijians want answers to. As I say, Fijians deserve to know. Our chief guest this afternoon is Dr. Nilesh Gander, Senior Lecturer in Economics at the University of the South Pacific. Please share the link on your own timeline so that you may include your family and friends in this broadcast. And I remind you that a full recording of this program can also be viewed at a later time on either Facebook or on YouTube as well. Now, Dr. Gounder, the Minister for Commerce, Trade, Transport, and tourism. Fayaz Koya has said that since the opening of the borders on 1st of December 2021, 50,742 tourists have arrived in Fiji. Over 90% of these visitors were from Australia and the US markets alone. Assuming the figures are correct, and there's no reason to doubt them, what is the future of tourism? And in relation to tourism, does the budget have any real strategy for it to bounce back? Yeah, so our key tourism markets are Australia and New Zealand. So combined together, Australia and New Zealand pre-COVID made up uh, around 60% of total, total tourism uh, in Fiji. So Australian tourists have started to come in since uh, December last year. The, the New Zealand uh, my, New Zealand borders are going to open soon, I guess, uh, end of this month or early next month. And, and we should uh, expect visitors from, from New Zealand as well. But beyond, uh, beyond the opening of uh, international borders, uh, I think what's also important is, is to generate confidence amongst, uh, amongst tourists uh, to go and, and visit uh, another country. Uh, given this 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 uh, COVID nineteen pandemic um, pandemic scenario, because tourism is, is is as a service is very different from from manufactured goods. It's not like packing uh, uh, manufactured goods in a box uh, and shipping it abroad. It involves uh, getting someone from another country to your country, and uh, it, we're talking about uh, people and and a lot of human behavior can can come into can come into play. So. Uh, a lot depends upon upon uh, how confident uh, tourists are in terms of traveling to, to to another country, especially Fiji, during this period of time. And so, all depends upon upon uh, the, the 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 behavior 
of 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 tourists in terms of uh, how confident they are visiting uh, visiting Fiji uh, as a as a destination. And and remember that's coming out of almost uh, almost two years of uh, of, of 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 a global uh, pandemic. And uh, the tourism industry has always received uh, support towards marketing, etc. Uh, they will all play some role, but the end of the day, it's about the, the tourists themselves and, and feeling more confident about going and visiting uh, visiting another country. We did not see our main tourism markets, Australia and New Zealand, uh, impacted uh, by COVID-19 uh, of the same magnitude that we saw other developing countries. So. Uh, which means that there will still be uh, large volumes of outbound tourism from Australia and New Zealand. It's just a matter of uh, where they go to and whether they are going to going uh, to, to other or not in, in the first place. And then secondly, where they are going to. So if, if one looks at um, outbound tourism from Australia, for instance, uh, more and more tourists from Australia are growing ab going abroad. But uh, we haven't been able to capture the more and more of tourists uh, who are going uh, abroad for their holidays. So, for instance, we have uh, so eight to ten percent of tourists who go abroad from Australia actually come to Fiji, and that figure has remained constant for the for the last uh, uh, just pre-COVID between 2015 to 20, 2019. So, so really, we haven't been able to 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 capture a larger percentage of the the Australian tourism market, the the the, the, the tourists who are going. Uh, out of out of Australia for tourism purposes, and remember, we also have competitors in the region. Uh, Vanuatu is, is is one of the competi competitors, and then there are other Pacific Island countries who are who are also developing tourism as an important development strategy. Uh, so so there will be tough competition within the region, but Asia also provides um, tough competition as well. So it all depends upon 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 how confident uh, tourists are and and where they are actually going to. Uh, and then coming out of out of this pandemic, that they, they need to have that confidence in terms of where they're going to, how well they are protected. If they do get sick, uh, how the systems and processes, the health systems, etc., all of these will also come into into play, I guess. All right. Now let me discuss some comparatives here. The reason why I have questioned the ability for Fiji's economy to grow by 11.3%. Is, is this. The US, uh, USA economy rebounded by 5.7% in 2021. I repeat, 5.7% in 2021. And uh, compared to a 3.4% contraction in 2020, the US growth was on account of higher personal consumption, investments, and exports. Now, may I please add that the U.S. economy is expected to grow by 4.0% in 2022 this year and 5.4% in 2023, respectively. Now, Dr. Gaundo, given these projected figures for growth in the U.S., what is the magic? What is the magic behind the Minister for Economy forecasting 11.3% growth in Fiji in 2022. What does he so, know that uh, I, we don't? So I, I don't see any direct link between Fiji's growth rate of 11.3% uh, uh, and, and the USA uh, growth forecast because um, we are very strongly connected to Australia and New Zealand. So for instance, take tourism, which contributes to around 40% directly and indirectly towards uh, our economic activity. Uh, Australia and New Zealand combined make up 65% of all the tourists who come to, to Fiji. And uh, Australia is uh, also leader in terms of uh, inbound FDI in Fiji. USA is nowhere close to, to the top, top uh, three or four in terms of the total uh, foreign direct investment that comes into Fiji. So our economy is not directly tied together to, to US. US, of course, is one of the largest economies in the world. And what happens in US has spillover effects uh, in terms of the global economy, and 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 so so the, those spillover effects in global economy will have some impact on on, on domestic economies. But our growth rate uh, is is a combination of factors. is is to do with how 
our industries are performing uh, tourism industry agriculture manufacturing they all contribute to the level of economic activity uh, then our uh, our gdp is also dependent upon the goods and services that we sell abroad to our exporting uh, countries etc uh, there are external factors also that can play a role in terms of this um, this forecast. So I don't really see what role the, the USA's growth rate uh, can play uh, in this uh, more than the indirect contribution that, that it comes from. It's no, one no, of no, no. the I important was asking, no, partners. No, I, was, I got to stop you. I was not asking about the role the US plays. I was doing a comparative. I was trying to say to you, that if the U.S. is expected to grow by 4%, and that's based on account of their higher personal consumption, investments, and exports, and their projected growth rate is, uh, is uh, expected to be 5.4% in 2023, given that is their projections, how can we sit here and uh, believe that Fiji is going to have an economic growth rate of 11.3% in 2022? That's what I was trying to do, a comparative. So, yeah, um, so I, I don't think we can, we can, yeah, Go sorry on. if I can, I don't think we can compare, compare those two, they're two totally different, um, different scenarios. Generally speaking, uh, if, if the COVID scenario wasn't there, we would normally expect uh, if, if, if the right policies are in place and right institutional framework, we would expect the developing countries to, to grow slightly faster than, 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 than developed countries. So, you know, that is in line with economic uh, theories argue about so I don't think those those two can actually be be compared. I, I, I you know one way to look at um, growth rates would be to look at more uh, of our competitor nations within the region to see if if say an, a country in 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 in, the, in South Pacific is is, is growing by four percent, what makes us grow by 11 percent? I think that would be a more more relevant question. I don't think USA is is any comparison in this 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 case all right i'm not an economist i'm just a simple lawyer you're the economist and the expert and i take your uh, words of wisdom but i'm not going to leave that 11.3 percent i'll have another go and i just want to you know have some clear insight into this um let's stick to this 11.3 percent for this one question only look uh, yeah. the asian development bank report released in November 2021, has said that Fiji had, and I quote, modest economic growth averaging 3.1% from 2015 to 2019. Therefore, if Fiji had a modest economic growth of just 3.1% pre-COVID, 2015 to 2019, uh, my question is, is it realistic to just accept the Minister for Economy's prediction of 11.3% growth for 2022, or should we ask questions? What is your response? Yeah, it, it does certainly look um, very optimistic uh, because of, of uh, the, the rate of re recovery and also the assumptions that have been made behind the, behind the, the growth forecast. So I would say it is, it is over-optimistic over uh, in, in that way. Uh, given the, the that one of the the uh, one of the drivers upon which the forecast is based is the expected number of tourism arrivals uh, for this year, so uh, it, it does look uh, optimistic. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, it's also driven from the fact that we are starting from a low base. So when you start from a low base, mathematically we are going to see a, a, a slightly a higher higher growth rate here, which does not necessarily mean that there is any real growth. Uh, coming out so but yes let's wait and see uh, it does it does look uh, if, if you want to ask me about whether it's realistic or not I would say it does look over optimistic uh, given the, the assumptions upon which this is this is based on that's what I was driving at and you've just said it over optimistic look I I mean I hope I had the Minister for Economy on the program because then I'd get answers the assumptions and the reasons uh, right from the horse's mouth, so to say. But unfortunately, I don't have that luxury. And uh, uh, you're in the firing line, so to say, Dr. Gounder. But look, nicely explained. Thank you very much. Let's move our discussions now. Um, poverty. 
Poverty remains one of the greatest challenges in Fiji. Uh, the poverty rate in Fiji has been rising, and the country's cost of basic needs poverty rate reached 29.9% in 2019 2020, according to the Asian Development Bank report. Now, I note that in one of your blog pieces for Australia, uh, for the Australian National University, you wrote that there has been no poverty reduction in Fiji between 20, 2013 and 2019. Now, this is a period of six long years. Can you discuss why this has been the case? Yes, so, so my argument was based on the, the Fiji Bureau of Statistics uh, report, the 2019-2020 Household Income and Expenditures, Expenditures Survey, which was um, which was released uh, in uh, in 2021 but the survey is based uh, on 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 the, the survey that was carried out HIES is based on the survey that was carried out uh, before uh, before covid and it's based on 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 uh, it, it provides a snapshot of poverty prior to the impact of um, of covid-19 and what it shows is that uh, poverty rate has actually gone up compared to the to the previous survey that was done in uh, 2013 and um, and 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 20, 20, 2014. So while poverty is a is a multifaceted uh, problem and there are a variety of of, of factors that can cause uh, that can cause uh, poverty. Uh, for instance, uh, a combination of macroeconomic factors such as low GDP growth over time, uh, lack of um, lack of investment, lack of uh, expansion of industries such as manufacturing, agriculture, where majority of the households are engaged. If these are not um, expanding or growing, then we wouldn't see more jobs being created or household incomes not expanding. As a result. Uh, can be one of the causes of, of poverty. But there can also be, apart from the macroeconomic factors, there can also be household and community uh, characteristics that can also uh, also play uh, also play um, also play a part. Uh, but uh, one of the main reasons, of course, is, is um, the major reason I would say is the is the macroeconomic uh, factors, which is uh, an economy which hasn't grown. Uh, in terms of GDP growth, well enough to have a, uh, or make a dent on poverty, poverty over time. So if if we, if we go back historically a little bit back uh, in the 1970, for instance, when we had the first uh, household income and expenditure survey, poverty rate was around around seven percent, and then uh, it went up to fifteen percent in the 1990s, and then in 2002-2003 survey, it showed it gone to 32 percent. And then the 2008-2009 survey, and then 2013-2014, it survey showed a decrease uh, to 28%. But uh, the 2019-2020 20 survey showed an increase, slight increase in poverty uh, to 29%. But uh, I think what's what's important is is um, is the argument that I made is that no poverty reduction in Fiji over the last six years refers to the 2014 to 2020 period because uh, the, the survey before the 2019-2020 was the 2013-2014 household income and expenditure survey, which showed a poverty rate of 28%. But the 2019-2020 survey showed a poverty rate of 29%. So which means despite the, the economic growth we have seen, poverty rate has actually increased. So what does that mean? That basically means is that the growth rate that we have had during the, the during the six years from 2014 to 2020, um, uh, were not good enough to reduce uh, reduce poverty uh, in in Fiji. So what it means is that the economic performance during the six years from 2014 to 2020 uh, has been unable to match its ability to lift more people out of poverty. And since economic growth is one of the the main strategies for poverty reduction, uh, Fiji has found it difficult to sustain higher growth rates that are that that's required to make a dent uh, dent on, on 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 poverty let us face some home truths here at this uh, juncture in the same asian development bank report 
under the heading Poverty and Human Development, it is stated that Fiji's Human Development Index rating for 2019 was 0 0.743, second highest among Pacific Island countries. That positions Fiji in the High Human Development Classification at 93 out of 189 countries and territories. Fiji's poverty rate has been rising, as you've said, even before the impact of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. It is not as if though poverty levels suddenly got bad because of the pandemic. We know it's been rising. What do you think are some of the factors contributing to rising poverty? You've mentioned macroeconomic factors. I mean, in simple terms, what are they? What are the factors contributing to poverty? So uh, uh, I'll go, go back to what you mentioned earlier. The, 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 you also mentioned about the, the IDB report and, uh, and the Human Development Index. So Human Development Index is a composite index made up of three indicators and that consists of per capita income, life expectancy rate, plus the, uh, plus the, there's a third variable in there that uh, deals with uh, the, the learning, learning outcomes. So uh, it's a composite index of, index of those three, uh, three variables. So it's uh, per capita incomes, life expectancy rate, and, um, and the literacy rate. Yeah. Sorry, the literacy rate, yeah, so three indicators. Now, if you look at uh, for Fiji, and f the research that I have done shows that Fiji is the only country in the world for which the HDI has gone up, and at the same time, poverty rate has also gone up. For the, all the other countries in the world, uh, when there was an increase in HDI, poverty rates actually declined. So what's happening? If you do a bit of a deeper analysis, you'll find that why that's the case. And I call that as, 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 as the paradox uh, of poverty in Fiji's case. And that's because uh, while our life expectancy rates started to rise from uh, starting from the 70s, and uh, it's sort of leveled off now, uh, starting from uh, mid 90s, our literacy rates have continued to increase. And we, we used to have uh, Fiji had higher literacy rates than some developed countries uh, in the even in the 90s. So the, the two factors that have contributed to a high human development index includes the literacy rate and the, and the life expectancy rates that we saw mainly uh, in the 70s and the 80s. But if you go and look at the per capita income uh, as, as part of that uh, human development index, per capita income has remained constant throughout. So in case of Fiji, while our, our human development index continued to rise, it was mainly because of the, the literacy rates and the life expectancy rates. The, the per capita incomes did not contribute anything to the rising HDI. And as a result, uh, because incomes weren't growing, uh, we have seen uh, this increase in poverty in the last uh, last 20 uh, or, or even 30, 30 years. So let me go back to the reasons that, that, that uh, you asked earlier on in terms of the, the causes of poverty. So our economy must continuously grow over time to ensure that uh, its industries are expanding and that uh, the private sector is growing, is creating more jobs, uh, unemployment is being reduced and uh, incomes are growing and as a result, household incomes are growing. So what we have seen in Fiji over time, uh, you know, one of the reasons, uh, of course, has been political instability. The coups have taken away a number of uh, development outcomes that we have that we had achieved over time. So every time we have a, a, have a coup or a political instability, uh, it does not only impact that fiscal year. Uh, the, the, the following years also get, get impacted. So if you look at 1987, uh, 2000, and uh, 2006 coup, the full impact of 2006 coup was felt in 2007, 8, 2007, 2008, and 2009. So this, this, this coups and the political instability has over time not only taken away economic growth, but also impacted our ability to create that invest, investor confidence that is needed to attract, attract foreign direct investment. 
uh, for instance, we have never been able to surpass foreign direct investment beyond 26, 27% of uh, GDP, because investment is very important for long-term growth rates. If, if Fiji would have been able to target, say, growth rates higher than 5%, we'd have been able to make uh, a dent on poverty now. But we haven't been able to, to achieve those growth rates, even on an average. So if you look at the, the growth rate for decades, uh, for each decade, 1970 to 80, 81 to 90, 91 to 2000, 2001 to 2020, the most prosperous decade for Fiji was the 70s. The growth, the highest average growth rate is between 1970 to 90, 1979. We haven't been able to continue growth rates uh, of the 70s or growth rates sufficient enough to lift uh, our people out of poverty and, and uh, more and more households have continued to slide into poverty. So growth rate is one, but also look at uh, our industries where our people are concentrated. Let's look at uh, the, the poverty rate. So out of all the people uh, whom we have defined as living in poverty, 60% of those people are living in rural areas. So if you're living in rural areas, it means you're connected to agriculture. And uh, agriculture hasn't been expanding in a way uh, that that uh, that um, we had expected to make a, make an impact, and uh, as there was a focus on 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 expanding tourism, it ended up creating uh, a low wage sector. So many people actually left farms uh, to move to service sector or the tourism sector, and manufacturing sector hasn't also grown in a way that uh, that it was supposed to to grow. Uh, initially, uh, in the eighties after the 1987 coup, for instance, there was a realization that the economy wasn't growing. And um, uh, the, the SVT government then uh, brought a number of significant reforms, trade liberalization, the tax-free zones, etc. So for a while, they played an important role. But um, tax-free zones are uh, also not the, uh, not the panacea for, 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 for the, the yields of the manufacturing industry. Uh, I think what is really important uh, is to con continue to drive growth rate that are well over five percent and for that we need to create that political confidence political stability we need investor confidence we need business confidence etc so that we allow the private sector to grow our industries to grow it creates more jobs etc and uh, our link with the the foreign export sector is also important we must continue to explore opportunities uh, to get market access for our firms and for our private sector so that they can go go beyond um, beyond borders is not good enough to set a platform for friendly investors friendly investors will always come here friendly investors will will will, will stay with us but it's how do we attract more investors uh, how do we give confidence to investors who are indifferent about investing here or in another country how can we give them more confidence so political confidence is tied together to business confidence household confidence and investor confidence. All of these, I think, are important. And the government must also uh, be more inclusive in terms of uh, stakeholders, consultation, etc., in terms of finding out the right solutions uh, towards, uh, towards looking at strategies to ensure that we, we lift our people out of poverty. So it's not only the private sector that can be part of it. Civil society organizations have been playing a very important role in this country in the last 100 years. and. Uh, for any government, it would be important to include the civil society organization as important stakeholders in social and economic progress. And in some cases, we haven't seen that. The government is actually involved in a public combat with some of the, the civil society organizations and also with um, with uh, worker unions, which is an important uh, civil society organization. So we need to now see a more inclusive approach towards uh, understanding and analyzing the real challenges that we face. And how do we move on from here, given that um, this is the economic scenario, economic and social challenges uh, we are facing? You know, those, uh, I mean, those things you've mentioned should be in every government's wish list. Uh, look, fingers crossed, somebody listens. But, uh, you know, when you talk about the need for consultation, one observation I have is that... Uh, from 2006, words like consultation do not exist. Look, let me move on. In responding to government's criticism of the 2019 and 2020 Household Income and Expenditure Survey, HIES or HICE, the Fiji Times reported you as saying, 
that the poverty estimates produced at all times, at all levels, rather, were reliable. You made this statement while responding to the Attorney General, uh, Mr. Kayum's criticism of the ethnic analysis of the survey. The AG questioned the methodology used for the study and had labeled it as flawed. What is your response? Yes, it was really surprising that the government would go ahead and, and, and attack uh, the, the HIES uh, in that manner. Because when the preliminary report came out uh, in, in early February, the government had basically accepted the, the poverty report. So the preliminary report uh, it just uh, contains the, the key aspects of the report. But the full report came out uh, later, later part of the year. And, and I think one of the reasons why the, they were so unhappy was that it contained ethnic-based uh, data. And, and uh, we know that the, the government uh, has, 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 has been uh, against any data that's collected along, along ethnic lines. So I think they were driven by the fact that uh, the report was released uh, with, uh, with uh, ethnic-based data. And, and that's why they went back uh, to, to, to attack the report uh, in, the, in, the, in the manner that they did. But my take, uh, I was initially involved um, in terms of uh, discussions because uh, Fiji Bureau of Stats um, usually, uh, usually consults a number of stakeholders uh, before survey, during the survey, uh, et cetera. So uh, we were, we were uh, involved uh, initially. So, so we know uh, the capacity that Fiji Bureau of Stats has and, 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 uh, and, and, and the, the sampling and the survey that they did. They're also supported by by university in the in the UK. A very well renowned uh, professor was part of the, um, the entire process of sampling, uh, data collection, and, uh, and and analysis. So it was. Uh, I, I did not see any flaw uh, in any of the, the 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 methodology or the way data was collected and um, and analyzed. So I think it was um, it was it wasn't fair in the way the government uh, attacked the, the HIES report because uh, uh, my take is that they just didn't like the, the fact that there was ethnic based uh, data analysis and, and they attacked the report on that basis. And I must also say that uh, if you look at the budget documents and uh, if you look at the, if you look at the, the budget, uh, if you look at the budget, um, uh, the economic and fiscal supplement uh, to the budget, you'll find that uh, the, the unemployment rate actually is used from the HIES survey. Actually, this, this revised 2021-2022 uh, budget cites unemployment rate from the, from the HIES the survey. survey. From the same report, yeah, it, it, it does cite that. So uh, this is where the... the the issue is, and, and uh, you, 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 you accept the report in February, but you try to rubbish the report uh, when the full report, uh, full report uh, comes out, just because you don't like some aspects of the report. Now, why do you think the HIES uh, report was reliable? Because uh, the, the way the, the, the sampling was done and the, uh, the way data was collected, uh, we have information we requested from Bureau of Estates. They provided us information from that. And uh, the other thing you must remember, Shashi, uh, our students are everywhere. You know, even we have, our students are working in Ministry of Economy, the government, the Bureau of Stats, uh, statistical agencies all over the region. So we have uh, we have our network and connection, which is very strong with our alumni. So we, we know the kind of work they're doing. And this is not the first time the Bureau of Stats actually did this. This is the... This is the, 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 the third time that they did uh, the HIES. And, and uh, when they did it for the first time, uh, after 1991 was 2002 and 2003. And they were, they were supported by Professor Wadan Nasi and by the, the, the World Bank as well. So, uh, so the, the, the Bureau of Stats had capacity uh, within, within the, the agency to conduct such an, such an exercise. And, and, and given the way they did it, and as an economist, uh, I don't see any, any issue in terms of the way that the report was uh, in terms of the sampling, 
the data collection or the survey analysis and the report that, that came out. Now, why would the government want to rubbish such a report? Is there, is there something to hide? I think the only reason that they would they, 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 they were taking that was because of the fact that it had uh, it had uh, it had uh, uh, poverty analysis based on based on ethnicity. So that was the that was the only reason I believe uh, was the, was the cause of that um, of that attack on on the HIES um, report because they accepted a report in February. When the preliminary reports came out. Okay. All right. Uh, now let's move our discussions towards government debt. These, uh, th there are a lot of questions being raised regarding government debt level. Firstly, can you discuss the history of government debt in Fiji, including the pros and cons, the economic implications of rising debt level for a nation such as Fiji? Yes, so uh, uh, at the outset, let me say that um, debt is not a bad thing. Uh, governments which run deficits and many, many governments uh, around the world run deficits where the, the expenditure is more than um, the revenue, there's a shortfall and that shortfall needs to be borrowed. But uh, we have always argued that any borrowing must go towards productive uh, expenditures and, and those productive expenditures include capital expenditures or investment, in infrastructure, roads, bridges, uh, schools, health, etc., human capital, where there is um, return generated uh, in future, and and that keeps the economy growing, and that uh, if the economy is growing, uh, those uh, those debts uh, can be paid back. But also, uh, economy must take debts based on uh, on uh, its ability to to grow. If if an economy that continues to take uh, run deficit budgets and take loans but is, it isn't growing at a, at a rate faster than the growth rate of its debt, will we'll eventually run into trouble. The uh, economy will have high, high, high debt, and a high debt means that uh, every year uh, some proportion of your revenue is going to go towards um, uh, payment of the debt. That includes the, the principal payments plus the, plus the interest payments, and that's that fundamentally where challenge, challenge lies in. So in terms of debt, I'll, I'll go back to 2005. The debt was around $2.4 billion um, for Fiji. Uh, let me also make it clear. Uh, every government has, has in Fiji has run a budget deficit uh, since, the, since the 70s. And uh, uh, every government has borrowed. But, it, 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 but the question now is uh, the magnitude of borrowing, the size of borrowing, and the impact of the, the level of debt on the on the on the on the economic performance in the in the medium to to long run. So so in to, going back to 2005, the debt was around uh, 2.4 billion, and if you look at uh, the the forecasted debt by July 2022, uh, it's around 9 billion. So that's a that's a big shift uh, between uh, 2005 and 2020 uh, 2022. Now, if you simply look at say 2007. Since uh, when the Beni Marama government you know, took power uh, after the 2006 military coup, so in 2007, the debt uh, the debt level was uh, debt was 2.7 billion, and uh, you compare you just compare those two numbers, uh, 2.7 billion in 2007, and 9 billion in 2022. Well, that equates to just those two numbers. That equates to around a 200 percent rise uh, in debt that's around a 200 percent rise in in debt now if you look at the same period uh, say between um, between uh, 2020 and 2022 that that period because that's a covid period uh, during that period debt has gone up by around uh, around 36 percent so why? So it's important to look at long-term trajectory of the of the debt rather than looking at just um, just uh, you know one or two years. So while yes, during COVID the government had to borrow, but it's it's not really uh, during the COVID that we get a real picture 
of the of the national debt story it's a, it's a story about how the government has been borrowing uh, every year uh, over time but i'm just comparing the two numbers between 2007 and uh, and 2000 and and 22 the debt two different levels right if you look at the the debt changes every year we'll get a slightly different picture but it's not necessarily a picture that that's completely completely different so uh, a, a growing debt means that as i mentioned a while ago is uh, debt has to be paid back and if debt has to be paid back then uh, every year government has to take some money out from the revenue it earns to pay off the the debt and uh, if your debt is growing it will also mean that uh, the amount you you pay off your debt every year the, the the principal payments plus the interest rate will also grow and as that grows more and more of your revenue will go towards payment of uh, debt or debt servicing payments and as that happens less and less of revenue would be available for government expenditure for productive expenditures so this is how economists look at in terms of the the the, the how rising debt would slowly chew away some of your future growth potentials or slowly over time situation can get worse if there are negative economic shocks and that's why something i mentioned a while ago is uh, or earlier in your in, in this program is is when we really look at the debt to to gdp ratio is much more than that that's just the number what we need to do is to go beyond that and find out what are the economic vulnerabilities so yes there are some countries which can take on debt and they can continue to pay because they are growing fast they are growing quickly but if we look at fiji's debt level and the rate at which we are growing and the economic vulnerabilities that we face uh, we are certainly in a very difficult scenario now dr gounder um, it has been mentioned uh, in in even in parliament i believe and i stand to be corrected um, that uh, borrowing smart borrowing is the way to go now is there anything like smart borrowing sorry sashi as an economist i haven't heard of smart borrowing as a term uh, within within my within within even the literature in, in economics but uh, if you can tell me what it is i can maybe discuss uh, <laughs> from no, from no. from an ec economics perspective I'm, I'm just, what it uh, no dr gounder uh, if you haven't come across it in all your academic career i'm not going there uh, just that i recall uh, and somebody's mentioned it as well in in one of the comments and that prompted me to ask you that uh, you know the government uh, conducts smart borrowing but let's leave it there now uh, look uh, even before covid-19 pandemic fiji's public debt to gdp ratio was higher than other smaller island developing states and had been rapidly rising from 43% in the financial year 2014 to 48% of gdp in the financial year 2019 driven by sustained fiscal deficits coupled with uh, major natural disaster events requiring larger a uh, large reconstruction now according to the adb report the government currently forecasts that the public debt will peak at a record level, level of 91.6% of gdp in this financial year please in layman's terms in simple english what does this mean can you just repeat the last part sashi sorry i i kind of yeah, missed it ADB, because yeah the adb report or the one before that i'll repeat so the when, whole question yeah yeah please so, do that uh, um the the i mean what i was trying to say is that even before covid-19 pandemic fiji's public debt to, to gdp ratio was higher was higher than other smaller island developing states and had been rapidly rising from 43% in the financial year 2014 to 48% of gdp in the financial year 2019 driven by sustained physical deficits coupled with major natural disaster events requiring large reconstruction now according to the adb report the government currently forecasts that public debt will peak at a record level of 91.6% of gdp 
in the 2022 financial year. So all I was asking is, in simple English, in layman's terms, what does this all mean? Okay, so uh, you mentioned uh, 2018 and 2019. Uh, 2019 in particular, uh, I think you mentioned 48% of GDP. So this is just before COVID. So uh, right. the, the nominal, so when we say 48% of GDP, basically what we are doing is we are looking at um, uh, debt relative to G nominal GDP. So uh, the, the size of the debt compared to nominal GDP in 2019 was 48%, the number that you mentioned. But uh, after, because of the COVID, uh, the growth rate had gone down, so uh, nominal GDP would be lower. And if nominal GDP is, is lower, then uh, you will see a, a higher growth to GDP ratio. And it, but at the same time, debt has also grown. So either uh, if, if, if the nominal GDP is constant and the debt grows, we'll still see a higher debt to GDP ratio. Or if the debt is constant, uh, but nominal GDP goes down, we'll see a higher debt to GDP uh, ratio. And, and basically what we are seeing here uh, is, 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 is looks at uh, for 2022, the, the, the 9 billion uh, relative to the, the nominal GDP forecast, uh, which, is, uh, which gives uh, 91.6 billion according to, to, to ADB. So we usually have GDP forecasts, which are, which are slightly different between the, the, the government, the, the ADB forecast and the World Bank forecast and the IMF forecast, not too different, but slightly different. So we, would, we definitely see a slightly different uh, debt to GDP ratios. But the slight difference are not really the point. The point here is uh, in terms of the, the, the GDP uh, to 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 uh, sorry the debt to GDP GDP ratios. But you also mentioned about the sustainability part of it. You said sustainable. Mm -hmm. I mean, in economics literature, uh, for economists, sustainable debt is very very difficult to define. There is no standing or acceptable definition of what is a sustainable debt. And uh, IMF does debt sustainability analysis uh, for four list member countries uh, and does for Fiji too. I have raised some issues. For instance, uh, the language they have continuously used and similarly ADB has been very wishy-washy kind of language in terms of not directly saying that, look, you know, if your debt is growing, you'd very soon uh, face uh, fiscal policy challenges or fiscal space challenges. This was the issue, uh, same with ADB and IMF. But I'm happy now that ADB has come out openly and said, look, there seems to be a, uh, there seems to be an issue now. And that's really, this is something we have been saying going back to 2015. But I think the, the, in terms of international relations, uh, the multilateral institutions and the regional institutions these days, uh, I assume, uh, want to make the member states happy. They don't want to put up a fight with the member states. Also, they seem to be working with the member states. So, uh, but good that, that, that ADB and IMF have both come out with more clear language the, in terms of uh, what they're saying, what they're implying about the debt situation uh, in, 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 in Fiji. The, the semantics is very important, I think, and, and you can't move away from the semantics in terms of using the actual words, the, the, the right framework uh, of, at, the, at, at, the right, at the right time. So, uh, and, and, and the way IMF, for instance, has looked at sustainability is this, Say if you have a $200 million loan, uh, offshore loan, and your loan is due next week, but you don't have any money to pay for your loan, what you can do is go to your go to another bank, borrow $200 million, and pay off that. To them, that's sustainable debt. But what has happened, you have just reshuffled your debt. You have just realigned your debt. You have paid your debt in bank A by borrowing from bank B. So because you have been able to to pay one by borrowing another for them, it's, it's sustainable. But really, you are just realigning or reshuffling debt. Your stock of debt uh, basically basically remains. All right, sort of borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. Um, you are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, and our chief guest this afternoon is Dr. Nilej Grounder, Senior Lecturer in Economics at the University of the South Pacific. Please take a moment and like and follow the SSTP page so that you may receive instant notifications of all posts and interviews on this program. 
Now we're trying to discuss uh, the very serious uh, topic of economics uh, of Fiji, the unpacking of the budget. So, uh, Dr. Gounder, I found it amusing that uh, in Parliament this week, and you'll be familiar with this name, John Maynard Keynes' name was mentioned when Professor Biman Prasad said that it seemed that the AG had only read parts of the literature of The Economist. Now, John Maynard Keynes was an eminent econo uh, economist who said that deficit spending is for bad times and not for the good times. It had to be balanced with surpluses in good times. Now, with increasing debt levels that we've had in Fiji, have we had any good times with the Fiji First government? I mean, what is the reality? They've been running the country from, uh, let's say, 2007. Have, has there been good times? Yeah, so uh, the economic growth indicators, uh, I think soundly, which is one of the main, main indicators, uh, and as uh, also said earlier, uh, it's not um, one of the best, um, best indicators around because it just gives us an average incomes. Uh, the, the period immediately after the, the 2014 elections, actually, we did see some real growth coming out. But, uh, you know, the momentum of that, that, that growth uh, trajectory was lost uh, by, by, by 2018. So we did see uh, a few years of, of growth immediately after, after 2014. And we can, we can, we can regard that as, as the period of, 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 of better growth uh, under, under this, um, this government. But uh, with the with the with the political rigidities that that came into play, uh, you had Neil Sharma last week uh, in your show, and and uh, and the way actually the government began to 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 behave and and, and interact politically uh, could have had an impact on 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 the other strategies uh, and their policies etc. So growth that that slowed down by by by, by 2018. So yeah, I would say that. Uh, 2014, 2015, these were the, the better years uh, in terms of the, the, the Fiji Fest, uh, Fiji Fest uh, government. I'll but coming finish. back to your point about, yep. sorry, I'll, I'll finish off with the John Maynard Keynes one. It's good that um, Keynes is back in, in Fijian parliament. Uh, uh, we used to hear a lot in, 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 in British parliament about, um, about John Keynes. So it's, it's good to hear. Uh, that John Keane says is, is back in Fiji Parliament, apart from our textbooks, uh, it's, it's always good to good to do that. Just what you mentioned. I mean, one of the Keane's arguments was you, you spend in bad times and then you try to save in in, in, in better times. Uh, that's possible when you have a robust and a growing economy. If you have a robust and a growing economy, yes, you can do that. But if your economy isn't robust and growing then uh, you don't have all good times. You basically your old times are mainly bad times. Uh, you know you hardly see any any, any good times uh, to ensure that you save. Why we haven't we had a, 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 a say uh, for 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 the sake of this argument? Why haven't we have a surplus budget? I, you know, if if, if we had probably a, a very good time, we would have a, had a surplus budget. But we can't. It's, it's, it's probably all. All times are, are very challenging and difficult times because the economy isn't growing uh, the way one uh, one expects it to grow to, to ensure that uh, we do just what John, uh, John Keane said. Dr. Gounder, I'll just ask you to pause there because I've got to address a question. Now, Samuel Mireya or Sam, Samuel Miraya has commented, and I'll read that, how about making this interesting by getting two-party show? I mean getting answers from the government side also so that people can decide on such topics. Well, Mr. Samuel Miraya, let me tell you, if you've just joined the SSTP program for the first time, then I will educate you on this. But had you been watching this program for the last 13 episodes, you would have realized that uh, invitations have gone to the Fiji First Party government to appear on this show. I would dearly have uh, uh, loved to have the Attorney General address his budget on this program so we could have dissected things. Look, my friend, uh, the program is very interesting with Dr. Nilesh Gounder. If you don't find it so, 
change the channel or watch something else, do something worthwhile. But let me assure you that uh, SSTP has extended an invitation to the government and I'd love the government to respond and come on this show. So let's just let it rest for that. Now, Dr. Gounder, do you think the level of debts that Fiji currently has, you mentioned uh, it's going to be $9 billion debt. Does it all go well for the country? I think given the, given the economic growth rates that we are seeing now and the, and the type of growth, uh, growth rates that, that uh, I expect to see in the, in the short to medium term, this level of debt is a, is a high level of debt uh, for an economy like Fiji. I'm, I'm factoring two points here in this. One, given the economic vulnerabilities we have uh, with, uh, with, in terms of the, 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 the high probability of, of uh, external shocks, such as national disasters or climate-related disasters, uh, plus external shocks such as uh, the war in Ukraine, etc. I mean, similar shocks can happen. And look what uh, what uh, COVID nineteen uh, did to the to the Fijian economy. So such external shocks can always bring uh, big damage to the uh, to economic activity here and disrupt um, uh, the, the the economic interaction. So that scenario plus the, the the fact that unless we have deeper reforms, unless we can make the economy grow. Uh, at, at growth rates beyond five percent, uh, this growth rate is this debt level is very high, and we are going to find it extremely difficult uh, to handle this kind of debt level. I'll, I'll uh, I think I'll give you uh, one uh, one example. So total debt servicing uh, that is interest plus principal payments for 2021 2022 this was this this is not based on the revised budget but the budget that was presented uh, last year uh, it was expected to be 757 million dollars this is the interest plus principal payments what does that mean in the context of of revenue it means 36% of total revenue for 2019 2022 original budget 36% of total revenue will go towards that repayment, principal plus interest. That's a big amount. And if our ability to generate revenue, uh, expand revenue, does not arise because we are not growing more than, say, 4% of GDP or 5% growth rate of GDP, then it will be extremely difficult to manage this kind of debt level. And, 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 and the way we are growing, I don't see we are going to get uh, anything more than government revenue anything more than 27 to 28 percent of gdp even if we reach 30 percent of gdp which is a very optimistic bar that i have put here 27 percent of gdp government revenue is 27 percent of gdp uh, that will still be a difficult task given that the high debt we have accumulated over over time uh, and, and uh, look Shashi, i'm not saying debt is a bad thing you know that is we need to borrow and and build infrastructure and roads etc but uh, we also need to be very clear in terms of what is our capacity to borrow, what is our debt stock, and uh, and and the the, the the inherent underlying uh, conditions that make up uh, that make up Fiji's economy and our ability to, uh, to 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 pay back. And 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 also we need to consider the how debt level has changed, especially in the last uh, actually seven years vis-a-vis -vis the, the government revenue that that uh, uh, that is end every year. Right at the beginning of uh, today's program, I asked you for your first impressions regarding the budget. Now, before we discuss uh, key aspects of the budget, let me ask you this. Um, I mean, I remember you did say that, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that there was really no real reason for the budget. Uh, question I wanted to ask is, what do you think was the rationale for this revised budget in the middle of the fiscal year? Yeah, I, I don't see any other reason than perhaps, um, you know, it's, it's uh, ele an election is near and that, um, you know, this could be a way to, to ensure that um, the government has laid the platform uh, to go out, go out and, 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 and campaign. Because remember, uh, in the budget consultations uh, before the 
the budget was announced, uh, the, the issues that people raised actually were linked to cost of living, uh, value-added tax on basic uh, food items, the minimum wage rates, uh, household incomes, uh, poor health conditions, etc. So these were the, the issues that were raised. And, and uh, I guess uh, if the government is preparing for an election before July, uh, this should be an attempt to prepare a budget and then go out there and, and campaign with uh, with some of these um, issues because otherwise they won't be going back uh, for to campaign given the the responses and questions they have received uh, during the pre-budget consultation. So uh, it, it seems that um, this could be an, 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 an election strategy rather than a genuine attempt to revise the revenues and expenditures to boost boost economic recovery because look at look at the government and uh, six months revenue and expenditures they could have carried on up until july and and if they wanted to give relief to households they could have brought a separate bill to parliament on vet on uh, on uh, uh, vet on duties and the minimum wage rate could have been announced like that there was no need to for a for, for a budget to, to announce the, the minimum wage rate dr gowder let us now discuss uh, some of the main aspects of the budget. Can you perhaps take us uh, through the main takeaways from this revised budget? I'll let you give the main topics, main points first, before I raise some particular questions with you. Yes. So I think that the positives uh, from this budget include the, the removal of the vet on basic uh, food item. That, I think, is important. It will certainly give some relief to the uh, to households, especially the, the low-income households, those who have been uh, uh, facing the burden of, uh, of higher cost of living, and also pensioners as well, and those people who are on, on those households who are on fixed income. So this will certainly give them uh, some relief. I think the other point that is, uh, has been important uh, is the removal of the, the duty on, uh, on, uh, on fuel. That will certainly play an important. This is something I had uh, I had also uh, argued for uh, before the budget because um, uh, the government should be able to sacrifice the revenue because on the, on the on the other side or the flip side of that would be it wouldn't be adding the inflationary inflationary pressures for businesses uh, and as well as uh, provide savings for. For households, and it's important to remember that um, petrol is an important uh, component of the transportation industry, especially diesel, is um, is the workhorse of the of the of the of the transportation uh, industry, and and uh, this should provide uh, some relief, not um, not a big relief, but certainly some relief uh, to households and to to businesses. The the removal of uh, duty on petrol, but of course. The removal of uh, VAT on, on basic food items uh, is certainly uh, a good move, a good strategy. The, the other thing I think is good uh, from the budget uh, announcement is the minimum wage rates. I think it was long, long overdue. The strategy is appropriate as well. Uh, it's a staggered, staggered approach, something that I had also uh, argued for way back in 2018. Uh, and if there was a staggered approach dating back to 2018, our minimum rate would have been four dollars by now, or even slightly higher than that. We wouldn't have had to wait for this long uh, for, for 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 this. And I know Professor Parta; he was uh, my colleague at USP for a short period of time. That's something we uh, we had discussed uh, before as well. Uh, so I think these are the the three main uh, important uh, takeaways from this budget, which are important and will provide uh, some relief to the low income earners to 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 households, to those on on fixed uh, income, uh, et cetera. I mean, unfortunately, the staggered approach, uh, you know, the, the final $4 would eventually be after the elections. And there may be some role of, of politics uh, eventually out there. But let's wait and see how it um, it actually it actually plays, uh, plays out. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Budgets look very good. Uh, the dates presented in Parliament, uh, because the, the the main issues, the key rhetoric is actually outlined, and then uh, when the debate happens in Parliament, uh, both sides of the House actually raise a lot of issues uh, for and against. So it makes a lot of noise. But the the budget, uh, the actual realization of the budget and the impact of the budget uh, depends on 
whether those expenditure commitments are actually laid out during the fiscal year as it is meant to be laid out. Uh, do all the expenditure commitments uh, are actually implemented and uh, usually made uh, the expenditure com commitments against the forecast of revenue. And actually what we have seen before this uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, highly optimistic revenue forecasts. And based on that, uh, against that, a, a set of expenditure commitments. Eventually, because they were highly optimistic revenue forecasts, the, the revenue forecasts never materialized. And I've written an article uh, on this, uh, and, and you can find that uh, on, the, on the INU blog. And, um, and, and I've listed too how these shortfalls. And so when, these, when there's a shortfall, then expenditure commitments are actually reversed throughout the year. So those things that are presented in the budget might not actually happen in the next 12 months because the, the revenue commit the revenue target or forecast uh, is actually met i mean this is the first time uh, you know in, in a decade or so that i am seeing for the first 6 months actually the the actual revenue is greater than the the forecasted revenue and i guess it's because of the the borders opening up uh, in december uh, and and that allowed economic activity uh, to to to, to pick up and that generated um, economic activity and contributed uh, to uh, to government revenue. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the actual revenue is 23% higher than the forecast for the first six months. But you know, you also look at the same period of time, uh, the expenditure, 440 million for the first six months has been underspent. So these are some of the challenges that still remain uh, that, that needs to be taken into account. So, you know, those were some of the I think the positives out of the budget. All right. Well, one feel-good news was, of course, the raising of the national minimum wage, which will be increased to $4 in four different tranches. Historically, Fiji's first ever national minimum wage was introduced in 2014 for unskilled workers, and at that time it was $2 an hour. Since then, we've had two rises. The first increase in 2015, when the minimum wage was increased to $2.32 per hour, and then in 2017, when the last increase brought the national minimum wage rate to $2.68 an hour. It has now been announced, uh, as you said, four tranches, 1st April 2022, just in four days' time, the minimum wage rate will increase to $3.01 an hour. 1st of July 2022, it will increase to $3.34 an hour, then to $3.67 per hour on 1st October, and finally to $4 per hour in January. Let us, let, let us break this down to a few specifics. So if we look at the first three months, there'll be an increase of uh, 33 cents per hour, Dr. Gounder, assuming that the unskilled worker works 40 hours a week. This will mean that the wage for the 40-hour week will increase by $13.20 per week. What impact do you think that first wave of wage increase will have on the people of Fiji, particularly the minimum wage earner? An increase so of $13.20. So the last minimum wage rise was in uh, 2018 when it increased to, it increased to $2.68. So mm -hmm. it's been four years now since we are going to see the next, uh, next rise. It will just be a minimal impact, given that uh, during the four years, a lot has changed in terms of uh, cost of living. So cost of living uh, has increased by much more than that, that price that we are going to see. But nevertheless, it will, it will have a, a, a minimal uh, impact. And that's why I think it's important to, to ensure that um, uh, the staggered uh, increases continue uh, to provide uh, much larger uh, benefit uh, to to those working in the in the unskilled sector. So this will just be very very minimal impact, given the how okay. cost of living has changed in the last four years. All right. So let's move it on. Uh, the minimum wage is now increased to four dollars per hour. It's January 2023, and using the same 40 hour week example, the unskilled worker will earn an extra 52 dollars and 80 cents per week. Now, what impact will that have for the person? 
and also for the poverty level in Fiji. I mean, is this increase going to alleviate the suffering of the people in any significant way? Or is this increase, uh, is it like creating an illusion of happiness, a mirage perhaps? So if, if it does go to $4, that definitely provide um, you know, some relief to households because uh, you know, minimum wage uh, has been $2.68 since 2018. So uh, a rise to $4 will definitely have an impact, although it may not be sufficient uh, to cover the cost of living. I think the, the, the reality is that um, the, in some of these cases, you can't increase minimum wages uh, too quickly given the, the impact on businesses, uh, etc. But uh, I think uh, taking it to $4 will definitely provide uh, some impact uh, and a positive impact uh, to, to households. Now, your question about uh, its impact on poverty, that's a very uh, difficult question because, uh, as I mentioned you know, earlier, poverty is, is multidimensional and, and um, we will need to wait and see how this, this minimum wage actually has an impact. Uh, where is the, which are the households that are likely to be impacted? If um, if we have households uh, that are in poverty but uh, they're not part of the the unskilled sector, they may miss out on this. So there may be some households who are engaged in agriculture. There, there are households which may be engaged engaged in the informal sector. So they may not be part of this um, this unskilled uh, sector. For those in in, in self employment, for instance, they may not be part of it. So uh, linking it poverty. Is, is and, and, and making a guess as to what impact is, is a difficult question at this point in time, Shashi. But definitely, uh, increase in minimum wage should should uh, should have uh, a positive impact on, on on household incomes and the ability to to consume goods and services and take off some of the cost of living uh, pressures. Well, that's that's good news. And uh, but still, on the four dollar per hour increment, the textile, clothing, and footwear industry council earlier this month said that the government's proposed minimum wage uh, increase was shocking and that there would be job losses. Now, in 2017, the council expressed its concerns over trade unionists' call for government to push the minimum wage from two sixty-eight to $4 an hour. As we now know, the government has announced that increase in four different stages. Now, there has been a reaction from the Textile, Clothing and Footwear Industry Council to the budget, and they have stated that they are shocked by the increase in the national minimum wage rate announced. Council President Mike Towler said a 50% increase over nine months was not necessary for these uncertain times. Do you think what the Council President Mike Towler says has any merits? Well, this is this is usually the three sides uh, to the to the minimum wage argument, and one side is that as if you increase minimum wage, then costs uh, for businesses go up, and it's possible that they are likely to 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 release some some workers and keep some workers. Uh, but there is also evidence that uh, during uh, if their minimum wage rises, many businesses are able to to absorb that, given that uh, they are now paying their workers more. Workers are likely to be more productive. Also, we expect um, consumption expenditure, et cetera, to go up. So it's, it's perfectly possible that some businesses will be able to, 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 to absorb those costs. And let's wait and see whether whether that really happens. I mean, we, we always hear that uh, around the world, especially coming from um, developing countries. Uh, actually, there is no evidence uh, to suggest that minimum wage will, wages, uh, increasing minimum wages will lead to unemployment. Uh, we don't have any research at the moment in Fiji, but perhaps this is a good time for someone like me to 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 to, to conduct a research see what actually happens. And we'll certainly have anecdotal evidence to, to, to see if that does happen. I mean, I don't have the financial extension, uh, but um, we'll have to wait and we'll have to wait and see. Well, we seem to be Having some internet uh, issues, I think, on your end, you're freezing up once or twice, but hopefully um, for the remainder of the program, things uh, do not go uh, astray. Now, let me touch on the FNPF uh, contributions. Here in Australia, uh, you know, we have superannuation contributions. Now, uh, even for casuals, 
Now, regarding the employer's contribution to FNPF, correct me if I'm wrong, but is it true that employers will not be making any contribution towards the unskilled workers uh, FNPF? So, if if it's uh, if it's in the informal sector, then it's then it's possible. Uh, but if it's in the formal sector, I guess uh, they would be covered by the by the law uh, to to make those uh, contributions. So, uh, if 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 there are people uh, in the informal sector, it's perfectly possible that they may not come under the the rules and, and, and the, the 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 laws which require compulsory payment of Fiji National Provident Fund. We have uh, cases of, uh, for instance, those who work as uh, as, uh, as housemates, as we call them in here in Fiji, uh, they may not, they are, they, where they employed the households may not. So it's, it's possible that in the in the informal sector, uh, that that can that can happen. And, and uh, I think uh, can voluntarily pay in good faith that um, uh, in the interest of the workers. But yes, it's possible that um, those who are not covered by the law from the sector, uh, this might not happen. That's the reality, I guess, of, of uh, developing countries where enforcement uh, is weak and enforcement cannot cover all aspects of economic interaction or economic activity. All right. Now, recent history shows that the National Federation Party, NFP, had advocated zero VAT on basic food items, removal of fuel tax, and the raising of minimum or living wages. The Fiji First Government had been opposing those suggestions since 2014. Even as recently as last week, during his consultation roadshow, the Minister for Economy had been arguing against any increases in minimum wages. Then suddenly, a change of heart. Why do you think there has been a change of heart? Is it because people were getting angry with the government? Or was this a desperate measure? Um, again, was this an election sweetener? Yeah, I think Sashi, you have mentioned all of those. So it could be it could be that they had the the people who were, were, were really upset in terms of the cost of living that they are facing, the low wage rates that uh, they are getting, etc. And and we saw, uh, I saw a number of uh, videos that actually showed the. Um, the consultations, uh, the budget consultations, where some of these issues were uh, were raised, and uh, yes, NFP's manifesto had highlighted uh, all of these issues, uh, and I assume that it could be all of those. Uh, and perhaps the government is now more enlightened. Uh, they have learned that uh, that this is the this is something that is needed uh, given uh, the circumstances. And it also could be due tied together to the um, to the fact that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it, this revised budget seems like an election is just around the corner, and that uh, here's an opportunity to tie to 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 include what people need uh, in that uh, in that budget. So yeah, it could be could be all of those things that you mentioned. So see, the political economy is very very interesting, and and uh, it does. Uh, Provide interesting uh, lessons in terms of how governments can 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 behave and 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 and, and switch their their arguments completely when um, when uh, when it suits them. But the sad part here is that uh, when politics is played at its best, uh, is the poor people who suffer because this could have been implemented uh, a long long time ago. I mean, uh, Professor Biman Prasad said that. Uh, the announcement to reduce VAT, removal of the fuel tax, it was a, a, a little too late, a too little too late in coming, because he said they had proposed this in 20, 2018. Now, given we have spoken about the dire poverty level in Fiji, do you think the government could have implemented the relief to the people much sooner, say seven or eight years ago? Yes, I think, uh, you know, going, at, uh, going back to minimum wages, I think this could have in looking at 2014, 2016, 2018, this could have been handled much better. So going back to 2018, uh, the the tripartite mechanism collapsed at the time of the the, uh, the, the implementation of the minimum wage. And, and then I, I recall the trade unions walked out 
and the government went ahead and implemented uh, two dollars sixty eight. So I think if if if, if the tripartite mechanism was working well, uh, whoever's fault it is that that led to the collapse. But it's in the interest of all parties to to ensure that they work together. Then we would have probably had a better outcome in terms of the minimum wage rates that that we are paying. So yes, uh, in in cases where stakeholders um, uh, fight with each other but and, and can't collaborate and can't work together, then the the public suffer and eventually the the, the poor uh, poor suffer as well. And then the same applies to 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 the to removal of VAT, etc. Uh, if NFP proposed it first. And the if Fiji first thinks that by by doing that, then they would be copying them. Then it's just uh, you're punishing the, the 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 poor people because uh, it's 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 uh, you're looking at more in terms of uh, your uh, how you are going to behave and how you may look rather than what's the impact on the on the poor people. Now. Let's take, for example, the 20 cent uh, reduction in the fuel tax. That was mooted about a year ago, and then some three months ago it was again suggested. The Minister for Economy, in response, is alleged to have said that the idea was stupendously stupid. I mean, I heard that uh, being mentioned in Parliament. Now, as I said a little while ago, politics has its own place. However, when a nation is hit with the poverty levels that Fiji has, when people are desperate and some parents just manage to have one meal a day, do you think that the government should have swallowed its pride and despite whether it was the NFP that suggested it or any other political party, that the government should have been proactive and brought this stupendously stupid idea to fruition much sooner? Yes, yes I to yeah, yes, I totally agree. And I, I have even argued that as well. The same issue is that the government can sacrifice that the revenue that it's collecting from duties because by not not uh, charging the duty and, and collecting revenue, it would be passing the same um, money to households as savings and uh, and to businesses as cost savings. Okay, now the 20 cent reduction in fuel tax. Who do you think it will really assist? Will it assist the average motorist or will it to a very large extent support and assist the top end of town, the, the rich and the mighty? I, I think it should have an impact on, on average motorists. Uh, so uh, average households are going to be going to be impacted. Of course, low income owners, uh, low income households may not benefit those who don't own motor vehicles, etc. But uh, given the, the car ownership uh, rates in Fiji, this should definitely have an, have an impact on, 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 on average, um, average households in Fiji. But beyond that, I think the, we should see some positive impact uh, in, the, in the transportation sector uh, as, as, as well. Well, that's, that's good news indeed. Now, while there has been a removal of VAT on 21 items, there has been a 15% VAT levy on 21 non-essential items according to the Honorable Minister. Included in this non-essential item is textile, clothing, and footwear. Let's look at this a little deeper. Uh, a family that has three children going to school will surely have to buy school uniforms, shoes, etc. People obviously need to clothe themselves. What do you think is the thought process to levy 15% VAT on textiles, clothing, and footwear? Is there a necessity to impose VAT on clothing and footwear? So here, what the government is trying to do is is to 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 recover uh, the lost revenue from 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 duties uh, and 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 the VAT removal of VAT on essential items through through VAT on these uh, other items that you that you mentioned, and uh, it's so basically it's trying to recover what it is foregoing. Uh, from removal of VAT on basic items and the removal of uh, duty on, on 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 fuel, and in its quest to do that, uh, this is what it has ended up with. And and uh, I'm surprised that um, clothing and textiles is included. It's probably they were looking at a list uh, to ensure mm -hmm. that uh, they make up the, the the lost revenue and and they to include that. But yes, the unintended consequences or consequence of that would be that it will lead to increase in prices of, of clothing and, 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 and textiles. Okay. Now, uh, 
The ADB country classification report is quite damning in its assessment of government debt management strategy. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, view was that Fiji remains at moderate but rising risk of death, debt distress. In April 2021, Moody's downgraded Fiji's long-term so uh, sovereign rating from a BA3 to B1 with a negative outlook. What do you think of the ADB classification report and the IMF and Moody's views? Yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm happy that ADB and IMF have now come out more, more open and they're actually saying what they should have said five or six years ago because uh, they, uh, IMF, for instance, uh, used to come and consult us uh, at USP regarding um, its, its, its consultation. So, um, yes, uh, I agree with those arguments that, that have now eventually come out uh, in terms of the debt distress. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, given the, the economic context of Fiji, uh, it's certainly uh, debt, the level of debt and, and, and uh, the growth rate forecast will, will create serious challenges in related to, to, to fiscal space. So uh, I totally agree with the, with the new assessment that's, that's done by the ADB and the IMF. And, and I'm happy that they have actually come out uh, now and, and they're saying that, what they should have said it, because this scenario hasn't just emerged uh, now. This scenario was there. It was just waiting for to, to the fault lines to, 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 to open. All right, uh, as we head towards our conclusion, let me raise this. The Minister for Economy in 2019 said that the Fijian economy had never been in a better shape, nicknaming conditions as the Mbani Maramam boom. He forecast uh, unprecedented growth of 11.3%, as we have discussed earlier, and which, uh, according to the Minister, will be Fiji's highest. My question to you, Dr. Gounder, is if the economy is so rosy as claimed by the government, why has there been the massive and unprecedented borrowing levels? And I suggest, uh, and I should add that this significant borrowing started way before the pandemic. Something just does not gel, it seems to me. Yes, I, I, I don't know what's the definition of boom there. But uh, in economics, we do have uh, booms and busts is when GDP is expanding. So uh, uh, a slight expansion in GDP does not necessarily mean that, uh, you know, you have reached a peak uh, or, a, or a boom. But uh, given the growth rates that we have been, these are certainly not uh, remarkable growth rates. These are uh, pretty basic or standard growth rates from 3% to 5%, uh, et cetera. Anything more than 5% would be would be considered as remarkable growth rates. And then the, the, the ability of the economy to generate revenue is just not there, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's, it's, it's the way I, uh, way I see it is it's basically impossible to generate uh, revenue each year that will go beyond, say, 28 to 30% of GDP. And if you can't do that, but you are spending more than what you are able to generate as revenue, then each year you are going to have a deficit. And that deficit is eventually going to add up and, and your stock of debt is going to going to, to rise. If it was indeed a boom, uh, why did growth rates go down in 2019? Uh, government had to cut expenditure on a number of, uh, for a number of ministries and programs in 2019. If, if they had to do that in the middle of a boom, then uh, they need to seriously consider how they, 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 they define a uh, define an economic uh, boom. But I would certain uh, from an economist perspective, I wouldn't certainly call uh, any of those growth rates as an as an economic boom, rather than simply an a mere expansion compared to the past year. All right, uh, have a drink of water, Dr. Gounder. Uh, um, like I said, I thought earlier, that was the last question. No, 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 no. We, we're, we're heading towards an end. Um, uh, as I said earlier, um, a fair comment and a balanced view would be to invite uh, a, a member of the Fiji First Government, perhaps the Minister for Economy, the Attorney General. And I must reiterate that our invitation has gone uh, and uh, we're awaiting a reply. And uh, I'd love to have somebody from the government come on the show to address a number of questions on many 
facets of uh, Fiji, its people, and government policies, etc. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Hopefully, one of these days, we might receive a reply, and hopefully, someone will turn up indeed. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, and our chief guest is Dr. Nilesh Gounder, Senior Lecturer in Economics at the University of the South Pacific. Dr. Gounder, let us uh, look at a few questions and brief answers from you. Let us look at the money coming into Fiji. What do you think the picture would have been if about 700 to $800 million in remittances didn't come to Fiji? Yes, I think the remittances have played a very important role in ensuring that um, household consumption has uh, is, is maintained. So uh, the uh, our, our Fijian diaspora in Australia and New Zealand, plus uh, the seasonal workers uh, and those working uh, under temporary schemes uh, in Australia and New Zealand, but also in rugby players in Europe and, and, and other places around the world have been sending money to their family, uh, especially, uh, but also friends as well. So that has been very, very important. Uh, just imagine if you take out seven to eight hundred million dollars out of the economy during a pandemic, it would have been a much, much larger uh, shock, negative shock to, to households. And, and I can't imagine the, the, the challenges and the difficulties uh, households would have faced if this remittance, this level of remittances would not have been received. So they definitely have played a very, very important role in ensuring that households are able to, to maintain their, uh, their their consumption. And also at, at, at the macroeconomic level, uh, cushion the, 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 the impact of the, of, the, of, the, of the crisis of the COVID-19 impact. Otherwise, demand would have fallen uh, much, uh, much, uh, much lower. This would have uh, led to a much higher contraction in the economy. Uh, economic growth. So we saw 20, 15 15 percent contraction in 2020. If this this remittances would not have come, this would, the economy would have seen a much larger much larger contraction. So they played a very very important role. Okay, now what would the real situation have been like if donor partners did not donate vaccines to Fiji? Was this not a pending recipe for disaster? Yes, certainly it would have been. I, I, we, we were lucky that we were able to get free vaccines uh, from Australia and New Zealand. And there are many countries, when we were getting free vaccines, there are many countries struggling to, to, to get access to, to, to vaccines. And I think they were really important in ensuring that uh, uh, we are able to, to open up and with our vaccination rights. So certainly a very, very important role. And, uh, and we must thank Australia and New Zealand for, 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 the, for providing us the vaccines, but also the direct budgetary support uh, during the last two years. Because without this support, the government uh, would have found it extremely challenging uh, to manage the economy. But also, it would have uh, had a bigger impact on, on our economy and our households, uh, etc. And that support uh, you mentioned earlier was about... Uh... $400 million, I guess, in uh, uh, grants, budget grants from Australia and New Zealand, correct? Yes, that, that was around 200 Fijian, 250 million aid in okay. cash. Uh, All right. Just for the 2020-2021 fiscal year, sorry. Yep. Oh, that's, that's fine. Now the sugar yep. industry. Uh, Dr. Gounder, the sugar industry has in the last 15 odd years declined so drastically. Government is now talking about alternatives to sugar. Uh, in the budget, uh, I mean, is it too late to save the sugar industry first? Because the budget does not say much about the sugar industry. There seems to be some silence. They're talking about alternatives. What's your views? Yeah, uh, I mean, I come from a sugarcane farming background and... Um, you know, in my community, there's nobody who does sugarcane farming anymore. Uh, and um, this weekend, I was in Singatoka. I managed to, to visit a number of places where they used to do sugarcane farming, but it's no longer there. So I think um, with, as, as a, within the, the primary sector, the importance of sugar industry has definitely, the significance has declined. Uh, but the industry continues to function. And I think if, if you take away the, the minimum guaranteed price, then the industry is destined to to collapse or to, to, to shut down. So the minimum guaranteed price, I think, has been important uh, in, in ensuring that uh, we have an incentive for farmers to, 
to to continue and suddenly you know the smallholder farmers uh, are, are struggling despite the despite the 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 minimum guaranteed price so uh, it's just, uh, my take is is that it's, it's too late to 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 completely revive the 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 sugar industry we may have some eventually some large farms uh, that that uh, that eventually eventually remain and um, uh, and, but also, you mentioned about um, alternative strategies. Uh, it's, it's, it's not too easy for, 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 for farmers to quickly shift. It, generally, what we have seen is a generational shift. So uh, unless the children uh, don't go to farming but get work elsewhere, then that provides relief to, to the farmer or to the, to the parents and, and the, the children are able to support. So, And we have also seen a case of aging farmers, um, etc. So the incentives are just not there a lot of farmers are staying because they don't have a choice and uh, so i would like to see that minimum gu uh, guaranteed price if it's kind of a social um, uh, social assistance uh, that is to ensure that um, farmers continue farming and farmers stay in the in the sugarcane farming business and that uh, we have uh, rural areas uh, that that have activity and uh, because uh, alongside sugarcane farming, the other agriculture uh, products are also important. So even when the sugarcane farming farmers keep bullocks and cows, so they also contribute to the meat industry, etc. They grow other uh, other vegetables, so there is also uh, contribution coming from from uh, contribution going to other other agricultural product as well. So I think in a nutshell, uh, it's still of still of value. But uh, the significance of that value within the primary sector has certainly declined. Given the discussion we have had so far this afternoon and your understanding of the Fijian economy, would you please identify three key challenges for the economy going forward? So I think poverty remains the number one issue uh, for the Fijian economy. And, and how do we ensure that we lift more and more people out of uh, out of poverty, the number two issue, uh, which is really important as well, and I think that's uh, the shocks that we see from natural disasters and, and climate-related disasters, which is again an important challenge uh, going into the future. And number three, I think, is uh, how do we ensure good governance and 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 uh, avoiding bad governance, and and to ensure that we continue with political uh, stability that eventually leads to to better better policies. So I think these three are the key challenges that, that Fiji is, is, is facing moving forward. And, and that those are the key issues that have taken our growth away and development away uh, in previously as well. And I think these will, will remain uh, important, uh, important challenges. Uh, how to deal with bad governance and ensure that we have political stability, dealing with um, climate-related uh, driven natural disasters and the impact of climate itself. And, and, and poverty. All right. Having said, uh, you've spoken about good and bad governance. So with the challenges just discussed, but also more broadly then, what strategies would you recommend to the government, to the opposition, and uh, other policymakers in terms of strengthening the Fiji, uh, Fijian economy? Yes. So I'll, I'll go back to, to, to once again, to the concept that uh, about ensuring that we we, we policies and and and, uh, and arrangements must ensure that we have continued economic performance. Our economy continues to grow over time, and a growing economy is very important because that will ensure that we not only achieve economic outcomes but social outcomes as well. Because in order to achieve social outcomes, the government must have the capacity uh, to to fund policies and resources that allows us to achieve social outcomes. So education, for instance, an important uh, social dimension uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the economy. And to ensure that we, we are able to, to continuously provide financial and other resources to the education sector is very important for human capital development uh, for, 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 the, for the economy. So uh, making sure that the economy, uh, the sustained economic performance uh, is really important going into the future. And for that, it's important for the government to 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 ensure that um, there is uh, consultation with all stakeholders, uh, 
there is better governance. Uh, we need more democratic accountability and to ensure that we have the right policies and frameworks uh, in place. Policies on their own are not good enough unless we have the framework for democratic governance, rule of law uh, and other institutional structures in place that ensure that there is democratic accountability and transparency. All of these are also very important beyond, beyond politics. Okay, now in my trailer to introduce you as the chief guest, I stated that we would discuss the good, the bad and the ugly aspects of the budget. Now, I need brief answers from you. We've kept our viewers for well over two and a half hours and uh, brief answers. What would you describe as the yeah, good so, aspects of the budget? Yeah, so the good aspects are the, the removal of the, the VAT on, on, on the basic food, uh, basic items. Uh, the minimum wage is another good aspect of the budget and the removal of the, the duty will certainly provide relief uh, to the much needed relief to the to the households. Wonderful. And what would you describe as the bad aspects of the budget? I think the the bad aspect is the is 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 the argument for the presentation of this budget at this particular point in time. I think there is there is lack of um, lack of uh, accountability in terms of what's the real reason uh, for for the for the for the budget and as well, in terms of the, the transparency as well uh, regarding the the need for a budget at this point in time. Okay, if that is the bad aspect, is there any ugly aspect as well? Yes, I mean one of the things that that uh, I knew that uh, I had an inkling that you might you you would ask this question, and I think one of the things that I want to highlight here is if you look at the the, the member contribution grant uh, that use that goes to the higher education institutions, and and what we see is that in the revised budget, the for USP is zero dollars, and uh, okay. uh, so I'm it's going born, to come to that. Yeah. If, you, if I can just please ask you to stop, uh, because let me raise that subject right now, uh, the subject sure. of USP. I've noted with interest, and you've just confirmed that, there is no allocation in the budget for the University of the South Pacific. The Fiji government, and I stand to be corrected, I believe still owes USP just over $60 million. Previous allocations, in the, uh, previous allocations made in the budget were not paid. When a budget is passed, it becomes law. Now, has the Minister for Economy done something unlawful by holding back and not paying the grant? Or could it be that uh, to probably save the government, the allocation has been removed from the revised budget? What is your response to that? Yes, so in the in the original 2021-2022 estimate, we had uh, 22.9 million. But in the revised estimate, uh, it's uh, the sum is zero dollars, which means they've taken that out. So yes, uh, if if it's a budget is a legal document, once this part this parliament, the expenditure commitments must be adhered to. Then it's certainly questionable in terms of uh, why uh, the, something that was an allocation that was passed by parliament was actually not not implemented. I, if if it's not uh, if we don't get an answer specifically related to uh, the fact that parliament has passed that and that uh, it has not been dispersed, then we, we need more transparency in terms of uh, why. And, and that, that actually uh, is, is, a, is a legal issue because it is passed by, by parliament. And similarly, uh, in the 2020-2021 budget, there was a 27.6 million allocation was also there, but uh, that's also uh, questionable. So yeah, I agree with you that um, you know we need to to to, to explore uh, whether this is illegal or not, because this was uh, approved by Parliament, but not uh, not paid. You know, uh, the minister is on record as saying that uh, there needs to be more investigation on Vice Chancellor Paul Alualia. We know that the USP Council has already done two independent investigations and has cleared Vice-Chancellor Pala Lualia of any wrongdoings. Uh, question arises, why do you think the AG is behaving like this? Do you think it's something personal? Because let's face the truth here. The decision to withhold USP's allocation is denying thousands of students, I think, from Fiji and the region, 
quality education at the premier regional institution. What would you say as an academic and a taxpayer from Fiji? Yes, I mean, the last point that you made, that's the reason why I would term this as the ugly part of the, the budget, because majority of the students at USP are from Fiji. And uh, holding off um, uh, Fiji's contribution of around 60 million is going to have a huge impact uh, on teaching and learning and research at, at uh, the region's premier university. And because majority of the students come from Fiji, uh, it'll, it'll definitely have an impact on the, on the majority of the on, on, on the Fijian students, but also majority of the staff are also from, from Fiji. And we are also a, a large taxpayer. The, our tax, uh, the tax that we pay is almost uh, very close to the amount that we receive uh, from, from Fiji government as, as member contribution. And uh, I don't want to call it as a grant because it's really not a grant. It's a member contribution that, that, uh, that uh, the, the governments have committed uh, for, for USP. So I, it's really behind, uh, it's, it's beyond my comprehension as to why uh, the Fiji government would do something like this. You know, if the AG comes on your program, you should ask him. Uh, but um, the my, if I look at the, what has happened uh, in terms of the, the whole story surrounding this, is um, the, the, the investigation for which the council cleared the, the vice chancellor. But uh, Fiji is part of the council. And uh, if you're part of a committee or a, or, or a council, then decisions uh, that are made are either unanimous or if there is some division, then, then the, the, the members of the committee or council can take a vote. And what I understand is that uh, Fiji wanted an investigation but the council decided not to have an investigation. So through a majority vote, Fiji lost what it wanted to do. And because it lost that, uh, it says we are not going to pay now because it didn't go our way. So it, to me, it really looks childish. It's, it's like a, uh, it's an argument from the, from the playground, but you take it back to the, uh, to the classroom. So uh, I find it really, really amusing that um, uh, Fiji government would be so, so petty in terms of uh, not being able to push through its, its view in a, in a committee setting where the final decision is made by, 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 uh, by a majority decision. I mean, uh, in, in, in a majority setting, uh, 50 plus one uh, has their way and the rest have to live, live with that. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm really surprised that, uh, that they have taken uh, this approach to, to deal with that. Uh, they have the largest number of representatives in the council, Fiji, and um, those issues that are raised in the council are taken, taken up in the council. So I'm really surprised that um, when the majority of the council voted not to uh, adopt their suggestion, they found that unacceptable. And well, that's, let me, sorry, go on. So, so I think that's the reason why I, I don't see any other any other reason why they would do that. They, they just didn't uh, like that. Well, let me tell my viewers that uh, hopefully one of these days very soon, um, our guest will be Professor Paula Luwalia, the Vice Chancellor. We have been in touch and we'll just let him settle down in uh, Samoa first and hopefully have him on the program someday very soon. Now, Dr. Gander, you are an academic, an economist, don't you think you may be better serving the nation from within the parliament? Will we see you contesting the next elections? Uh, not, uh, not at this point in time. I think um, I'm, I'm better off being an academic uh, and I, I love being an academic. It gives me, uh, me the opportunity and the freedom to, to, to meet some of the brightest minds um, in the region and actually love to tell uh, people that uh, in the civil service or in the private sector, that we see the stars before you actually see them. And uh, it's great to, 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 to be among some of the greatest minds in the region, but also conduct research and our ability to, to, to analyze policies and, and, and discuss. So at, uh, at this point in time, uh, it's, uh, it's a no. Rashi, thank you. I'll take your no because uh, hearing you answer questions today, the thought process that you possess, I think uh, you probably will be better 
served to nurture the young minds of students rather than uh, uh, being given two or three minutes to talk in Parliament and for the rest of the time uh, not having an opportunity to address issues. Now, as we draw to a close, what is your message to the people of Fiji? Well, I think uh, the in terms of uh, the economy, we are going through some of the challenges now, big challenges because of COVID, etc. And I think uh, the economic recovery is slowly coming its way. We just need the, um, the right policies uh, and the right framework for, for economic recovery and growth uh, to take place. And uh, I have a lot of faith in, 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 I told in another program as well, in, in the ability of our economy uh, to, to generate, um, uh, generate economic growth. Uh, and uh, to ensure that we lift more and more people out of the pov out of poverty, but we just need the right politics and uh, and the right economics to come together to ensure that uh, we are able to to do do that and to improve the the quality of lives of of our people. And, we have uh, the resources, we have the capacity yes. to do that. We just need the, the right time and the right people. Well said. Now my final question, and this question goes to all my guests. Uh, what is your reaction to the SSTP program that you've just participated in? I've put you on the hot. Well, thank you, Sashi. Yes, and um, thank you when you when you first invited me. Uh, by that time, I had seen one or two, but I think you have uh, you have developed it into a very popular program uh, by now. When when you invited me, I then went back and looked at uh, some of the previous programs, and I think um, uh, you have got a very good show going on here. And uh, you have you provide opportunity for, for for people like me and others to come on your show and discuss some of the issues. Uh, actually, we don't have uh, this kind of opportunity uh, here from our local media organization. So people always ask me, "How come you are not uh, participating?" I said, well, "If I'm invited to, then I'll certainly be be there." So thanks for the invitation, and I hope uh, you know your 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 future guests uh, uh, are important uh, to, to throw light on some of the, the main issues uh, facing, facing, facing Fiji. Well, that is the reason Sashi Singh's Talking Point was initiated, to give people like your good self the opportunity to express your views about things that are very, very important for Fiji. Now, Viewers, don't go away yet because I've still got to tell you who our guest is for next week. I think a lot of people will be surprised uh, as soon as I mention the guest. It's going to be an exciting program next week. Now, let me say there are a number of items that we should be keeping an eye out for in terms of this budget. Amongst uh, them, let me uh, say that we'll have to observe if the following things does happen. As the Minister for Economy says, Fiji is back. Well, he says from early May, open heart surgeries will be available in Lautoka. Let's wait for that. Says unemployment assistance uh, for the people of Vanuolevu. This includes a $100 one-off payment. That is a probability. We hope to see that happen very quickly. He also says Bar Hospital will move from Bar Mission Hospital on the 9th of April. All current services delivered at the Bar Mission Hospital will be provided at the newly upgraded Bar Hospital facility. Let's wait to see whether that happens on the 9th of April. He says two operating theatres will come online in the coming months and the hospital will provide an, an offer 24 hours cardiovascular surgeries, chemotherapy and other critical services. It will also give local doctors exposure and valuable training in this expert medical fields where he wants Fiji to excel. We'll watch and observe also says $338.2 million has been allocated for the Fiji Roads Authority. 325.1 is for capital projects. And uh, what are these capital projects? We don't know yet. $60 million allocated to the Fiji Roads Authority to repair severely affected roads. When does that start? Don't know. But we'll keep watching that. And a revised budget to Water Authority of Fiji of $195.2 million. How and when and where this will be spent is anyone's guess. 
But these are positive signs. Let's see. As I said, we need to observe. Well, Dr. Nilesh Gounder, thank you very much for being chief guest in Sashi Singh's Talking Point this afternoon. I really appreciate you taking your time out to discuss in a very forthright manner a number of issues that concerns the economic health card of Fiji. I'm pleased that you've been able to share some very interesting insights on the subject. Thank you very much. Vinaka Vakalevo to you. Wishing you a very blessed Sunday, Dr. Nilesh Gounder. Thank you for having me, Shashi. It was a pleasure talking to you. Naka. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, as I said, don't go away yet. I have yet to tell you who is our next uh, guest. I thank all the viewers who have taken time to provide their positive feedback uh, with regards to the program. As I say, we ask the questions that Fijians all over the world want answers to, Fijians want to know. Well, that's all for episode 14 uh, of this week. A big thank you to my regular contributor, Nikhil Singh, for his input in the program today. To my SSTP team, a very big thank you as well. I'd also like to thank you, our viewers, for watching this program today and uh, for spreading the news, sharing it, and liking the SSTP page to get instant notifications. A big vinaka vaka level to you as well. Well, next week is a program that I'm really looking forward to. You've probably heard or read uh, on Facebook columns from Grubsheet. Yes, Grubsheet. Next week, our chief guest will be Mr. Graham Hunt Davis, a Walkley Award, Logie Award winning Fijian born Australian journalist. He previously hosted a weekly Australian television program, The Great Divide, on the Southern Cross Austereo TV network, and was a consultant to the Washington based global communications company Corvus on its Fiji account. Now back in Sydney, Mr. Davis has been a strong critic of the Fiji government. We will discuss a number of things with him in the next uh, program. That's episode 15. So Mr. Graham Hunt Davis is our chief guest for next Sunday. If you have questions for Graham, please shoot them through to my SSDP page via the, the, the message column, and uh, I will try to raise them with uh, Mr. Davis. So, with that said, episode 14 has come to an end, and I wish you all a very safe and blessed, blessed week. In closing, I'll leave you with this quote from Herbert Hoover, who said, Freedom is the open window through which pours the sunlight of the human spirit and human dignity. Freedom is the open window through which pours the sunlight of the human spirit and human dignity. That's from Herbert Hoover. Well, with that said, uh, I am Sashi Singh, bidding you goodbye, namaste, and nisa more. Thank you, and goodbye, world. Cheers.